Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I am Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. Pleased to be co-chairing this hearing with the wonderful Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Women's Affairs Committee. And we are going to be Chair of the Women Committee on Women. I stand corrected. Already the man is off to a bad start. Uh, um, I'm, I'm actually going to <laughs> I'm going to try and model enlightened male behavior by giving uh, a, a short and uh, not scripted opening statement so we can pass it off to my um, colleague uh, who will delve into some of the details. Um, so when a mother dies in childbirth or due to complications of pregnancy, that is what um, some people call a zero acceptability event, which is to say it's never okay. And there's no level at which we can say that we are, um, that we can tolerate. Uh, every single time a mother dies in childbirth or during pregnancy, it's a failure of our health system, it's a failure of our society. And it is happening in New York City on average 30 times a year, on average 30 times a year, a number which is going up, a rate which is higher than the rest of the country, uh, a rate which compares poorly to the rest of the world. Another 3,000 times a year, women suffer near-death events during pregnancy and childbirth. And these are not trivial uh, complications that they can often lead to uh, lifelong uh, disability and health complications, um, 3,000 times a year, near-death events. And this scourge is not affecting all women equally in New York City. The maternal mortality rate is 12 times greater for African-American mothers in New York City than it is for white mothers. So I'm going to pause and let that sink in. The maternal mortality rate for African-American mothers in New York City is 12 times greater than it is for white mothers in New York City. How can this be? We don't actually have satisfactory answers to that question, which is part of the reason why we are convening the hearing today, because we need to demand answers to fix this. But there is increasing evidence to support the notion that the healthcare system itself is treating black mothers differently than it's treating white mothers. That the, the views and feelings of black mothers are being ignored uh, in the pregnancy and birthing process by the medical profession, uh, a phenomenon which was dramatically illustrated by none other than Serena Williams, who um, has suffered from a blood condition that she was well aware of. This is a professional athlete who obviously is in tune with her body as an athlete would be. Um, knew that she was experiencing something that was wrong and was ignored by her doctors and nearly died after a C-section because she was ignored. This was a celebrity, a woman with money, uh, a black woman who was ignored. And one can imagine the obstacles that someone without the celebrity and status and resources could face as a black woman in the healthcare system. We need a cultural shift in healthcare in New York City and in America that uh, tackles implicit bias, that uh, respects the views of black women, that listens to them, that hears them when they express pain, uh, when they report on what their own bodies are experiencing. Um, we need to empower frontline medical providers like nurses to be heard by doctors and others higher up in the food chain when they are echoing the feelings of, of, of these mothers. And we need to tackle the broader societal impacts of racism, which are leading to disparate health outcomes, whether it's in housing or air quality or lack of health insurance that are now being magnified um, during, during pregnancy and childbirth and are leading to some of these uh, unconscionable statistics. Um, I am really excited today to talk about these solutions and to talk about a package of bills um, that Chair Rosenthal is putting forward 
um, that are going to get us towards a solution. And on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Chair Rosenthal uh, for further introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Levine, certainly one of the men who gets it. Good morning. My name is Helen Rosenthal. I chair the Committee on Women. The rates of maternal mortality and morbidity, especially among black women, point to a health crisis both nationally and locally. Not only is the United States' maternal mortality rate uh, the highest in the developed world, but it has increased in recent years. And the issues that New York City face are even worse than at the national level, due especially to the disproportionate death rate of black mothers. Chair Levine highlighted many of the key statistics that explain what brought us here today. Among the most startling, I think, is how the United States compares to nations that are the best at caring for pregnant people and keeping them safe. In 2016, the United States maternal, mortality, maternal mortar, mortality rate was nearly 29 deaths per 100,000 births, shockingly high compared to other industrialized nations. Italy's rate was 3.9%, Finland's 3.4%. Disaggregated by race, the crisis is shown to be even more stark. While white women in the United States had a mortality rate of nearly four times that of women in Finland, the rate for black women was nearly 13 times higher. Maternal health, health outcomes are a textbook example of the issues that our country faces at the intersection of race and gender. These issues are perpetuated by implicit and explicit bias. In the medical profession especially, myths about different pain thresholds between the races persist, as do harmful stereotypes about the competency of women of color. Broader environmental factors exposure to polluted or unsafe uh, neighborhoods and homes, as well as the stress caused by navigating a racist and misogynist power structure, also contribute to the health crisis. As such, the city must approach this issue with a broader public health lens and not confine policy to what happens within the walls of a hospital. Most fundamentally, I'm sorry, I'm just smiling because the doulas have arrived <laughs> with the babies, and I'm just so delighted to welcome them here. Most fundamentally, high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity are a direct result of a society that while theoretically can be responsive to the needs of a fetus, does not adequately consider the needs of the pregnant person. A structure that subjects those already in a vulnerable position to the most unacceptable of experiences. Today we will hear testimony from witnesses who have experienced this bias and unwillingness to listen in its most severe form. We will also hear how the city has committed itself to addressing this fundamental imbalance and is to rectifying the situation. The Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will testify about their impressive roster of initiatives aimed at improving maternal health outcomes this includes the Healthy Start Initiative in Brooklyn, which includes the provision of doulas through the By My Side program. Another is the Sexual and Reproductive Justice Community Engagement Group, a grassroots group of community leaders, activists, and nonprofit organizations that meets monthly to plan and implement policies and programs on issues such as this. 
The department has also set up a maternity mortality and morbidity review committee to ensure that every single mortality incident is carefully reviewed by medical experts and community leaders and that lessons are learned to prevent more deaths in the future. I look forward to hearing from the Department of Health about these and other extraordinary programs and how they can be improved upon and expanded. Now is the time to think about how to scale up existing programs and address the crisis head on to take on our new challenges. To that end, I'm proud to introduce two pieces of legislation which we will consider today. The first, Intro 913, would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to create a plan to provide access to doula services to all New Yorkers. A doula is a trained professional who provides continuous physical, emotional, and informational support to a pregnant person and their family before, during, and shortly after childbirth. A doula is not a medical professional, but they can play a critical role in supporting a pregnant person. During pregnancy, this can include everything from practical help scheduling medical appointments to answering basic health questions to providing emotional support. During childbirth, doulas can play a critical role in providing physical and emotional support to a person in labor. They can also support the decisions made by the person in labor, helping communicate these decisions to the medical team and ensure they are taken seriously. And after childbirth, services can include practical, educational, and emotional support. You're not gonna just hear it from me. We're so excited to hear from the doulas and the doula leaders in the room today. The academic research has shown that these support services can make a difference. In 2017, the Cochrane Pregnancy and Childbirth Group conducted a comprehensive review of research into programs around the world that provided doula services. It found that women, it found that women allocated continuous support by people like doulas were among other benefits, more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal birth and less likely to have a cesarean birth or instrumental vaginal birth, more likely to have a healthy child as measured by the five-minute APGAR score, and less likely to report negative ratings of or feelings about their childbirth experience. Here in New York City, research has revealed Similar results for infant health and maternal satisfaction, although not for direct maternal health outcomes. And that will be interesting to understand why. And I'm going to posit a guess that it has to do with our, what happens inside uh, the birthing room here in the United States versus other countries. Analysis by the By My Side pilot program in Brooklyn has revealed stati statistically significant decreases in preterm births and underweight, underweight babies, as well as significant improvements in women's evaluation of the childbirth experience. We will also hear testimony, we will be hearing testimony from our local doulas today um, about their experiences in New York City and how their services can and could more help the com communities most in need. Now's the time to begin planning how to scale up the provision of doula support services and how to do so in a way that stays true to the roots of doula services here in New York City. The governor recently announced his intention to set up a pilot for using Medicaid funding to pay for doula services. This represents an exciting opportunity, but also a challenge. Part of what has made doulas so effective in communities across the city has been their grassroots nature. 
We are at a crossroads for the provision of doulas. Intro 913 comes at a perfect time to ensure that the city of New York is prepared to meet the challenges and take advantage of the opportunities of this movement as we consider how to ensure that every person who wants one is able to access a doula. The committees will also consider Intro 914, which builds on Local Law 55 of 2017 by expanding the reporting requirements and codifying the Department of Health's Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Commission. I look forward to working with the Department of Health and with other stakeholders to make sure that we get the reporting requirements right, safeguarding privacy, but also ensuring that meaningful analysis on the causes of medical negative maternal health outcomes will continue into the future. In addition to these bills, today's hearing is an opportunity to discuss the steps that are needed beyond the legislative power of the City Council. We must start talking about how to influence the culture of medical care and public health. The advocacy that doulas provide is only as effective as the doctors allow it to be. The recommendations of the Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee will only be effective if implemented by the medical providers. As such, we must think bigger than a single law. What is needed is a coalition between the city, the state, community activists, and medical providers to redesign the way we care for pregnant people from the ground up. Maternal mortality and morbidity is a crisis in this country, but it's solvable. What it will take is listening to women, listening to all pregnant people. It's on us to design a system in which their voices, our voices, are heard. Let me conclude with a note on language. Both pieces of legislation under consideration today refer to pregnant people rather than pregnant women. Certainly, most pregnant people are women, and it doesn't make sense to divorce pregnancy from the broader range of women's health issues. But non-binary, trans, and gender non-conforming individuals also give birth in New York City. Given the health disparities that the LGBTQ community faces uh, more generally, it is important that we are inclusive as we consider solutions to pregnancy-related deaths and health complications. It is hard to get that language exactly right. The standard term is maternal mortality, after all. But know that this city council and this city want to approach this conversation as inclusively as possible. Let me thank the staff who made this hearing possible, including the Committee on Women Council, Brenda McKinney, Policy Analyst, Chloe Rivera, Finance Analyst, Daniel Krupp, Legal Fellow, Rabia Kasim, as well as my Legislative Director, Sean Fitzpatrick, and our Legislative Interns, Rob Bentley, Bentley-Eski, and Anissa Ayub for their work in preparing for this hearing. And with that, I'd like to recognize uh, the other members of the City Council, Brad Lander, Alika Amprey samuel um, Lori Combo, Keith Power, and Diana Ayea. I turn it back to you, Chair Levine. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to hear from our first panel, the administration, and I'm going to ask our committee council to please administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yes. Good morning, Chairpersons Rosenthal and Levine and members of the committees. I'm Dr. Deborah Kaplan, Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Maternal, Infant, and Reproductive Health at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. 
I'm joined by Dr. Torian Easterling, Assistant Commissioner of the Brooklyn Neighborhood Health Action Center. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the department's work to reduce maternal mortality in New York City and related pieces of legislation. The mission of the department is to improve the health of all New Yorkers and to eliminate health inequities, which are rooted in historical and contemporary injustices and discrimination, including structural racism. It is through this lens that we focus our work related to maternal, infant, and reproductive health. The history of New York City includes the systematic segregation of people of color into neighborhoods that were deprived of resources for decades. To this day, these neighborhoods still carry the burden of underinvestment, including limited access to healthy food, safe places to walk and exercise, and other resources necessary to be healthy and thrive. The department recognizes that improving women's health before pregnancy is critical to reducing maternal and infant mortality and addressing the unacceptable racial disparities in birth outcomes. To inform our work, we monitor and report on maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity surveillance data. To date, the department has issued two reports on enhanced surveillance of pregnancy-associated mortality which are deaths during pregnancy or within one year of pregnancy from any cause, and pregnancy-related mortality, a subset of these deaths that are causally related to the pregnancy based on data from 2001 to 2005 and 2006 to 2010, and you, have those, you should have those reports. A similar analysis for 2011 to 2015 is currently underway and will be completed by the end of the year. The department collects this information through death certificate data and additional surveillance of pregnancy-associated deaths using the New York State Department of Health statewide planning and research cooperative system known as SPARCS to analyze inpatient hospital discharge data. As was noted earlier, in New York City, approximately 30 women die every year of pregnancy-related causes. And while the pregnancy-related mortality ratio decreased 48% in New York City between 2001 and 2010, it is consistently higher than the national average, and the racial disparities in pregnancy-related mortality are unacceptable. From 2006 to 2010, black women were 12 times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause than white women. Pregnancy-related mortality is associated with obesity, underlying chronic disease and poverty that also disproportionately affect New York City's black population. The chronic stress of racism and social inequity contributes to pregnancy-related mortality, along with racial disparities in other health outcomes, including infant mortality, preterm birth, and low birth weight. In 2016, the department released a report on our citywide severe maternal morbidity surveillance system we are the first municipality in the United States to do so. Severe maternal morbidity is defined as a life-threatening complication during childbirth. Examples include heavy bleeding, kidney failure, stroke, or heart attack during delivery. To put this in perspective, for every woman who dies of a pregnancy-related cause in New York City, approximately 100 women almost die. Our surveillance found that the rate of severe maternal morbidity in New York City was higher than the national severe maternal morbidity rate, and that it increased 28% from 2008 to 2012. Nearly 3,000 women experienced life-threatening complications during pregnancy in 2012. And as with maternal mortality, we found stark racial disparities. The severe maternal morbidity rate among black women was three times that of white women. This holds true regardless of other socioeconomic factors such as education. In New York City, a black woman with a college degree or higher is more likely to have serious complications during childbirth than a white woman with less than a high school education. The department has a number of groundbreaking programs focused on addressing systemic causes of maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity through hospital and community-driven in interventions. The department currently operates a Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee, known as M3RC, to review maternal deaths and make evidence-based recommendations at the community 
health system, provider, patient, and policy levels to prevent future deaths and life-threatening complications. Members of the M3RC include health providers from local hospitals and other health facilities, as well as representatives from community-based organizations, doulas, midwives, researchers, first responders, and others to meet to develop comprehensive recommendations that are meaningful from both a clinical and social perspective. There are similar committees in several other states across the country, though ours is the only committee focused on a city. The New York City M3RC is especially valuable because roughly half of the statewide maternal deaths in New York State occur in the five boroughs. The department is also focused on supporting women's health before, during, and, at, before and during pregnancy to ensure optimal outcomes. In May, the department announced the Maternal Care Connection, a collaboration with SUNY Downstate Medical Center to improve obstetric care and chronic disease management, both of which contribute to racial disparities in birth outcomes. We look forward to updating you further on this work soon, once details are finalized. Related to this work is the Sexual and Reproductive Justice Community Engagement Group, or CEG, which is co-led by the department and community partners, including community leaders, activists, and nonprofit organizations to guide and inform the implementation of the department's sexual and reproductive justice work. Through the CEG, a focus on birth justice has been adopted so that people know their rights during pregnancy, birth, and immediate postpartum period in the healthcare setting. Key to the birth justice campaign are the birth justice defenders and birth justice champions. The birth justice defenders are a group of community residents who come together to educate others in their communities and advocate for safe and respectful maternity care for all individuals. The birth ch justice champions are medical providers, including OBGYNs, physicians, midwives, and doulas, who work to mobilize their communities around the principle that everyone giving birth deserves to be treated with respect and attention and to have their needs met. This group promotes best practices for respectful care at birth within healthcare facilities. The birth justice champions are conducting a series of grand rounds presentations on birth justice and respectful maternity care at hospitals around the city. And presentations have occurred at Elmhurst Hospital, Jamaica Hospital, and Montefiore Medical Center, and more are planned for this summer. Intro 914. I would now like to turn to the bills being heard today. The department supports the intent of Intro 914, which would expand Local Law 55 of 2017 to require the department to report additional data on maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity and establish a maternal mortality review committee. As I mentioned, it's important to have a local maternal mortality and morbidity review committee in New York City, and we thank the council for recognizing the important work our committee is accomplishing. The department currently reports to the council on maternal deaths disaggregated by borough of residence and race ethnicity, and we understand the importance of being able to track progress in order to understand the factors associated with these complications and develop policies and programs to move the needle in the right direction. Protecting the confidentiality of the women whose cases we study is of the utmost importance to the department, and we're happy to work with council to determine appropriate aggregate level maternal mortality data to add to the report to provide a more comprehensive description of maternal mortality cases in New York City while protecting patient confidentiality. Intro 913. Intro 913 would require the department to assess the needs of pregnant people and the availability of free and low-cost doula services. We support the intent of this legislation and look forward to working with council to provide meaningful data to inform this work. The department currently operates a number of programs supporting doula services and growing the doula workforce in New York City. Through funding from Healthy Start, a federally funded program that aims to eliminate perinatal health disparities, we operate the By My Side Birth Doula Support, the By My Side Birth Support Program. By My Side provides free doula support to low-income women during their labor and delivery. Since its creation in March 2010, By My Side has served over 850 clients and their families including labor support at more than 670 births. The Healthy Women, Healthy Futures initiative funded by the City Council offers doula services to low-income women throughout New York City. 
The initiative also trains and hires women from neighborhoods served by the program to serve as birth doulas. The majority of clients are referred through partner through participating CBOs, which include Caribbean Women's Health Association, Brooklyn Perinatal Network, and Community Health Center of Richmond. The department also collects data on the needs of pregnant women. Since 2001, we have collected these data through the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, or PRAMS, a population-based survey of new mothers in New York City des designed to monitor maternal experiences and behaviors before, during, and after pregnancy. Findings from PRAMS are used to enhance our understanding of maternal behaviors, develop and evaluate programs to improve maternal and infant health, and inform policy development. Doulas are an important part of the compendium of services to increase infant and maternal health outcomes, including midwifery and hospital and community-based interventions. We share the Council's goal of increasing access to doula services for pregnant individuals and are currently working with the New York State Department of Health as they develop their pilot project to expand Medicaid coverage to include doula services. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaplan. I think we've been joined by, no, we, everyone, uh, okay. <laughs> We're not used to such prompt committee members. They threw me you, off. You can say our names again, though. <laughs> Welcome, Councilmember Barron. We have a full house. Thank you all for joining us. Um, you did mention the disparity between black and white mothers in New York City, the 12 to 1 ratio unconscionably high. You did not mention, unless I missed it, um, disparate treatment by medical professionals, in particular the phenomena uh, which both Chair Rosenthal and I mentioned in our opening statements of tendency to disregard um, what uh, black mothers or expectant mothers report about what they're experiencing, including pain. Um, um, would you care to comment on that? And, and more importantly, uh, tell us how we're going to fix this. Absolutely. Thank you for that really important question. So, and in addition to structural racism and how that affects health outcomes, we need to look at and we look at institutional racism. What happens within the four walls of a hospital or other institution that is based on us living in a racist society and the impact that has on the very institutions that serve, that are there to serve people. And so initially, one of our concerns we've heard certainly from individuals in our partnerships with community engagement group, with doulas that we work with, from, from people who have spoken to the to their experience of being disrespected or treated poorly and their belief that this was based on their race and, and their gender, both actually. And so we do not, what we first looked at at the health department as we are very much data driven and want to have data to document and quantify this to make it even more powerful. We looked at the PRAM su surveillance that we, uh, I mentioned earlier, which is a representative sample of women who give birth in New York City. And we decided to add questions on disrespect during and respectful care and how women are treated th at the time they give birth. We worked with representatives from the community engagement group and other experts in this field and, um, and developed questions to add to our PRAM surveillance. No one in the country has ever done that and we, we did it in time to field it this year. So we are now collecting data on a representative sample of women who give birth in New York City, specifically asking questions about their experience. Were they treated? We use the word disrespect. We ask them how they were treated, and we will be able to document that and report it out, we hope, early next year. We, we will have that report as earlier than usual. So that's the first step. The second step is as we work with hospitals, and we mentioned the maternal care connection um, at SUNY Downstate uh, in, in East Flatbush, and we hope to, to continue to work with other hospitals, there is a new protocol uh, called the Perinatal Disparities Bundle, and bundle refers to best practices. It's very new and has not, is just being piloted at this time, but it is a, and we, it is a um, steps that hospitals can take to address institutional racism. It recognizes that not only does it exist, but that need to be 
institutional, not just individual trainings, but structural changes in the hospital to both measure and address and give patients serve the opportunity to say what happened and give that, that feedback back to the hospital. There is implicit bias training to, and an interesting to talk about explicit bias and implicit, what are, so that people who sometimes are aware and hold biased opinions, some people who don't realize that they're behaving differently based on someone's race, ethnicity, gender, and other differences, um, helping them to become aware of this, and then measuring how that as actually experienced by women who, when they give birth by asking them directly about that. So not just by PRAMS, which is a first step, but that's citywide. It won't tell us information at the hospital level. So, and, and we, uh, SUNY Downstate has agreed and we're looking to encourage other hospitals to agree to implement that disparities bundle. We're bringing in a, a, con a national consultant who's an OBGYN, has worked around birth equity for years to help support our implementation. And because this is new, we need to evaluate it carefully. We've, we have a lot to learn on, are these the right pieces? And we need to have continuous feedback uh, to help us with that. The other thing I'll add is um, the birth justice uh, champions, and actually our consultant who works on them is here with us today and, and representing doulas, um, which are really bringing on providers to be people who are committed to respectful birth and be a, be a voice. We've held initial first time ever grand rounds in uh, I, four hospitals, there will be another one this week, uh, where we for the first time brought in women, people who've had experienced traumatic birth experiences in one way or another to tell their stories at the grand rounds. And so we now have 45 people from around the city who are trained in storytelling to really how to tell their story in the most powerful way possible. And at part of our grand round, and if, if you've ever been or heard about grand rounds, generally this is case presentations, they're very clinical, uh, they focus on what went wrong clinically. And bringing in someone who is there to tell their story, we believe, and we've heard from initial feedback, is an incredibly powerful way to drive home a message. It's not theoretical anymore. There's a human being there telling what happened to them and why certain behaviors by providers or the institution affected how they experienced their birth. I'm, I'm very happy to hear about your move to collect data on patient experience from the perspective of, of the mother and glad to hear about the piloting of implicit and explicit bias training. I would urge you not to wait for the data to come in. We know, we, we know this problem is out there and we need to act immediately. And uh, I'm generally not a fan of pilots. Uh, I believe we just need action. And when it comes to this training, it needs to be rolled out immediately. As we're doing in other professions, in the police force and elsewhere, anywhere where implicit bias needs to be addressed. Um, I'm, 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 I understand there's a lot of medical providers we have to reach, but we should move immediately to touch everybody um, because this problem is real and people are dying and we have to address it now. Just to add, we, we could not agree with you more. This is a crisis. This is unacceptable to have our city with the 39 maternity facilities, um, 38 hospitals and one birthing center. Uh, there are many hospitals in the city that people can access and yet we're seeing these unacceptable disparities. We're not waiting for the data, let me stress. We are moving forward and we agree there is what we're describing that we're working on today, there is much, much more to do and we are looking at what more we can do w at right now. So that, but the data will both create a baseline of data and help us to see are we being successful, are we actually changing, are we seeing an impact a year from now and every year if we continue to measure this. Without that, we will not know, it will be, well, it's one way to know are we having an impact. I am pleased that we're joined by Dr. Easterling, um, who uh, I believe uh, represents, is leading the Brownsville Health Action Center, which I think it's in Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel District. Uh, of, believe, course is is. of course it is, of course it is. So I'm sure she's happy to have you here as well. Um, the work that the centers are doing on the ground is directly addressing the conditions which are leading to disparate health outcomes for people of color, particularly expectant mothers, African-American mothers. 
Um, and I would like for you to tell us a little bit about how your work directly impacts um, some of the challenges that we're talking about today. Sure. Um, first, good morning uh, to the council, to the committee, uh, to Chair Rosenthal, as well as Chair Levine, uh, to everyone in the audience. Um, this has been a long time coming. Uh, and so just on behalf of the hundreds of doulas uh, in this city who have been advocating uh, for their voices to be heard, to be at this table, uh, to really make sure that they uh, were being valued in their work, uh, just really wanted to commend uh, the committee for really championing in this work. Um, and so, uh, as you've mentioned, Chair Levine, so uh, I serve as the Assistant Commissioner for the Brooklyn Neighborhood Health Action Center. There are three neighborhood health action centers throughout the city. Uh, one is in Brownsville, uh, the other two, one is in Harlem, uh, East Harlem, and another one is in the South Bronx uh, in Tremont. Uh, we work to coordinate and co-locate services, so we have both clinical and non-clinical services because we understand that individuals are not leading and living single issue struggles uh, and single issue lives. And so therefore, we wanna make sure that we're coordinating clinical services as well as making sure that people have cribs and making sure that they have car seats and they have childbirth education classes uh, and the exercise classes that they need. Um, but the other, uh, I think the most important piece that we do out of our action centers uh, is coalition building with both community-based organizations hospitals, faith-based organizations, and many other stakeholders within those neighborhoods. Uh, for example, in Community Dis District 16, uh, Councilmember Samuels' uh, district, what we do uh, to work with all providers and as well as community-based organizations is to understand uh, what the challenges and barriers are that people are facing uh, that deals with uh, implicit bias, that also deals with explicit bias as well as how services are rendered and allocated to individuals. Uh, and we know that the data already shows uh, that there are disparate health outcomes in Brownsville, social uh, outcomes that are in educational outcomes that are disparate as well. Uh, and so how can we better connect services to the people but also make sure that these are culturally relevant and quality services? Uh, and so as we uh, had already talked about, for instance, the maternal care connection, there's an opportunity to bring and amplify voices uh, as people are providing these services, how services are going to be presented. And so having those voices at the table will certainly help to make sure that the providers are presenting in the best way possible. And I think that's the best way that our action centers can be a vehicle to be an amplification of all the voices in neighborhoods to make sure that providers are showing them the best way. Well, as you mentioned, we have a grand total of three of these uh, extremely important on the ground public health centers, neighborhood action centers, and some of the neighborhoods with uh, the largest population of African American communities are not currently served, including Rockaway, um, Jamaica, North Shore of Staten Island. And uh, what's particularly incredible is in each of these locations, I believe, there are formerly, they're now vacant, formerly um, uh, occupied public health centers that the department used to run that we've shut down. I think there were 30 uh, in the LaGuardia era. So um, you know, we, we made it a top budget, budget priority, one that unfortunately uh, wasn't funded in the budget to expand these centers. And I do think it is directly relevant to our topic today, which is uh, the kind of preventative care that can avoid uh, a crisis occurring uh, during pregnancy and childbirth. I want to pass it off to my colleague. Just my, my last question uh, for Dr. Kaplan is, often in these hearings when the administration says, we support the intent of a bill, <laughs> translated to English, that means we don't support the bill. So uh, I just I, I want to give you a chance to, to, to clarify um, what the administration's stance on these two bills are before I pass it off to my colleague. What that means in this case is we, we, we have a committee. So when the, when the council speaks to assuring a committee, we have one and we want to, and we already report data, we are able to provide additional data. And, um, and I can give you, uh, just one sec, I wanna make sure I get this right. Um, I need new glasses. <laughs> um, 
Yes, so we will be re re able to give more comprehensive information on the deaths, and we, we don't want to, what, what, the reason we can't be specific in the testimony is because we, we're looking at and wanting to assure that we protect confidentiality. Some of the data requests could compromise because of the small number of deaths each year. And so we, while we are able to provide specific, more data than we already are, we can't commit to the specifics without a conversation after the hearing. I appreciate that, and I'm going to pass it off to Chair Rosenthal for uh, further questions on that and other topics. Thank you so much, Chair Levine. Um, I, I'm just going to ask a few questions because I know my colleagues are eager to ask questions as well, and we have a room full of doulas um, who are eager to testify as well, <laughs> and we've, we've worked so hard together. I do just want to um, follow up a bit on Councilmember Levine's question. Would it be possible for you, and I understand the hesitancy about the data privacy, that's fine. Um, I don't think you answered the question, that, I'm not sure if you asked, but the same question as it has to do with provision of doulas to everyone who needs one. And what I would ask that you put together um, after this hearing is a strategic timeline mm -hmm. of what you think is doable. Um, I'm sure there are financial considerations when it has to do with the doula services, but when we think about, um, uh, again, referring back to Councilmember Levine's point about, you know, we have to, you know, be in grand rounds in every hospital immediately, if that piece too you could think about a strategic timeline for how we get to every hospital in New York City to make sure that people understand, um, hear the storytelling from women who have had these experiences. It's, um, you know, as we look at the data, we, the one question comes to mind, why not send all people to better hospitals than the worst hospitals for maternal outcomes? But no, all the hospitals need to be um, providing service that is um, without bias. Um, so what I would ask is that I would like to see a timeline, a strategic timeline for getting it done in New York City. Mm -hmm. I get it, it's a big city and there are a lot of hospitals, but that's simply, you know, the city we live in, so that's not an excuse. What does it take and how long will it take to get this done in every hospital, specifically about the issue of storytelling? Um, if there are other ideas that you specifically know can be helpful now, um, I would include that on the timeline as well. Absolutely. Um, just to underscore what you said, which is that this is what we described is not sufficient. There, there is much more to do. This has been an intractable, unacceptable situation for years. The fact that the disparity widened from 2001 to two, between 2001 and 2005 and 2006 and 2010, and we'll soo soon see more recent data the fact that it, the, the severe maternal morbidity went up 28%, it was already bad and it's, and it's going in the absolutely wrong direction. So we agree 100% and I just realized I found, I, I just wanted to underscore around additional data that could be included, um, which is uh, to Council Member Levine's question. It could include data, aggregated information on, for, each, for people who died around age, education, birthplace, interactions with the health system, such as prenatal care and location of death. And we're merely wanting to have that conversation post-hearing to make sure we're very careful about that balance between having comprehensive data that's publicly available and not compromising confidentiality. A hundred percent. There's no question that that will be done. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank I mean, you. Can I just add, um, it, it, I know you brought this up uh, regarding intro 913, uh, and I just wanted to be clear uh, that the department fully supports the expansion of doula birth support services, postpartum services in the city of New York, uh, full stop. 
Uh, and I think the, the language around intent, uh, uh, the support of this legislation, is really to the point around the assessment of the needs of pregnant people as proposed by Intro 913. The department wants to work with the council on how best to collect that meaningful data. Uh, as Dr. Kaplan has already mentioned, we have various tools to collect that data, so we just want to work with you to make sure that we do that properly. I say this with a full heart. You know how much I appreciate the Department of Health and the, facts that, the fact that you are already leading the way um, compared to any other city in the work that you're doing. I fully appreciate. Um, we have this tiny window of three and a half years to get some real work done, and I would just love to see a one-year timeline for what we can get done very, very quickly. Um, actually, uh, just um, I have questions. I, I'd like to move on. I'd like to let my colleagues ask some questions. So, um, I don't, Majority Leader. Oh, sorry. So Council Member Levine, I refer yeah, to, okay. count, so Majority Leader Cumbo, I know you wanted to make a statement and ask some questions. Thank you for your service. Thank you to my chairs Rosenthal and Levine. Thank you so much for hosting this incredibly important uh, hearing at this particular time. I just want to first start by saying I am so happy that at the City Council that babies have become such a permanent fixture in City Hall. Every day, there's another group of babies that are here, and it's just phenomenal because we are certainly changing the dynamics of uh, where it's appropriate to bring a baby. And so I hope that through these hearings and continued conversations, we begin to see a normal society is a normal society anywhere that babies are. So this is really very powerful, and I thank you all for being here. Um, as a new mom, I have questions. Um, Obviously, as an African-American woman, I just gave birth at the age of 42 to a 10-month-old. And let me tell you, normally, when I get applause, I'm like, no, stop it. But after hearing these statistics, it really is, unfortunately, something that has to be applauded because over the last five years that I've been here and I hear uh, all of the hearings that we face, you know, when we talk about disparities, particularly between African American women um, and all other women and women of color, you know, everything from the disparities around pay equity to HIV and AIDS to issues around domestic violence, heart disease, uh, issues around mortality and breast cancer, and now talking about maternal mortality, it's really a miracle that African American women are ultimately here and still thriving and beating the odds and continuing to challenge these. Uh, I, would say, I would say that the reason why we're in many of these situations is because of racial disparities and they're not just stereotypes. There have been systematic uh, issues in place, everything from a lack of health care and insurance uh, to many others that we're here to address today. So I certainly thank you for being here. For me, as a, as a new mom, when I was giving birth, um, I didn't want to have an epidural. I wanted to do it the way that, you know, I wanted to be completely 100% natural. But I had had a miscarriage five years prior. And because I had a miscarriage five years prior, it was recommended to me that I have what's known as a cerclage, so that that would be a stitching up of your cervix. And they would remove the cerclage about a month and a half prior to your actual pregnancy. So I had my stitches removed, and when I went to give birth, uh, for some reason they kept stating, and I was having extreme pain, but I knew that having a baby was going to be painful, but I had extreme pain that kept dropping my heart rate and they couldn't figure it out. They didn't understand why my cervix wasn't opening. I had been at the hospital for hours only to find out that the doctors that took out my stitches from my cervix didn't take out all the stitches. So I had to have an emergency um, epidural place and they had to remove the stitches and then my, my uh, cervix was then able to open and I was able to then 24 hours later give birth. But these are the challenges that many women face and it's, it goes against 
every stereotype from economic to education, these are the stereotypes that, that every woman faces. And so I think that it's important that we continue to have these particular dialogues and conversations because our mortality and the issues surrounding it are very real. So just fast forwarding to questions, when I left the hospital, and that's what I, or even before, you know, I had spoken to my doctors about the fact that I wanted to have a midwife. I spoke, someone had sent me a video of Ricky Lake having a baby naturally, right, in the water. And I saw all of these things. Now, it may seem funny because I, I'm 43, so in many ways I thought, I, I don't ever have to know anything about having a baby. I don't have to know anything about that because I'm not having a baby, but then, pow, I'm having a baby. So it's like I had to learn all these things. So people are sending me all these videos. So when I spoke to the doctor about it, it, it was basically making me seem like those ideas were ridiculous, this idea of not wanting to have the baby at the hospital, the idea of wanting to have a midwife or a doula, the idea of having a baby at home, all of these concepts that I heard of um, that I presented to the doctor were immediately, and because I'm a city council member, I don't have time to find out if what I thought was ridiculous or not ridiculous. And then coming home, um, no one ever set, stated to me like, we have services that could come to your home. Because what happened for me is that I utilized basically the emergency room as my doula care, if you will. So when I brought the baby home and his birth weight dropped, I brought him back to the hospital only really to find out that babies do drop their birth weight naturally after you have a baby. And then afterwards, he didn't poop for one or two days. And there was supposed to be, I guess, some type of routine of what color the poop is supposed to be and how often it's supposed to be. I didn't know all of these different things. So I can imagine for myself, and, and I have about 100 of these stories about why I went back to the emergency room, um, what can be done so that women that need support um, during and after are paired with that support. Because I was never paired with that support afterwards, and I only gave birth 10 months ago. And if that support's still available, I'd love to have it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll just start by saying that I, I have two grown children, both through midwife uh, delivery, and even when I needed a C-section, I had the midwife there. And I believe that midwives um, are critical, and there's strong evidence to show that women who give birth who are attended by a midwife, even if they require more complex care by a, an obstetrician, gynecologist, or a maternal me fetal medicine uh, person, have better outcomes. So, uh, you know, we are strongly believe that that's, that should be a, available to any person who wants to have a midwife birth, that that should be available. There are not nearly enough midwives right now in New York City to provide that kind of support, and there's real variation by hospital. But that is critical. Um, the doula piece, so right now, it, you know, it's, and it, this is on, it really where you go for care and who you see has a big impact on what is it made available to you, what you're informed, Etc. We are working um, with our community engagement group on developing guidance around, and it will soon be out. Uh, I wish it was out today, but it will be by the end of the month. Um, guidance on standards for respectful care at birth. And our hope is that through our work at the community level and with providers, that all people have information on this is what you have the right to, and that and to help people feel that they can if they can't get that where they're going, that that's something that is should be available and where they can go to receive it. So that is gonna, you know, will that be tomorrow? Everyone know about it? No, but we, you know, believe that many people are not informed. I mean, one thing that you didn't mention that I would add is that we hear about um, some of the public publicity that came to complications for women um, either dying or almost dying after delivery were women who went home and then came back to the hospital and had comp, you know, serious uh, com complaints that were not always addressed properly. Mm -hmm. And so it's also about educating people on what are the warning signs that something might be going on and trusting your body like Serena Williams did. You know, that not everyone can feel that level of, of okay, I have a bad headache and if, no matter what someone says, I know something's wrong. We need people to feel that that is 
that those symptoms are concerning and if you don't get the care you need, you need to go somewhere else. And it, it's a lot easier said than done because there are people may not have access or feel they can get that care. So I'd say in the short run, I agree with you. Where can you go to get that care? There are doulas in this room and uh, you know, I think that is available. And, um, but I think it, right now it's, it should be available for across the city and it's not. So we have a lot more work to do to assure that people have the choice of a midwife and a choice of a doula if they want it, but also the education of our OBGYNs around the kind of information that you deserve to have that was not provided to you around your side of your symptoms, what you wanted, the fact that you, you asked for something and it sounds like it was dismissed, that's not okay. You, that, mid, there's, in my mind, no reason you couldn't have had a midwife, even if you needed, for some reason, a doctor there as well. I think that what you're saying is valuable. I think that sometimes when you work, when you're so familiar with something, it, you take it for granted that someone is mildly even as aware of you. So if you don't know, if you don't know what's out there, you don't know what to ask for. So I wouldn't have known necessarily to ask for doula care or or a midwife. I would not have necessarily understood how that would have come into play. I think other questions that need to be asked of mothers when they're going home um, are questions around who are you going home to? What is your home environment? Do you have a support system? Are you going home alone? Um, are you going home to a spouse? Are you? What, what are the circumstances within the relationship? Do you, do you feel that you perhaps need additional support? When do you have to go back to work? You know, like there needs to be like a series of questions so that it can be, um, a, a profile can be given of that person to know exactly what support services that they are gonna need, either coming in or, um, you know, if you have a C-section, you may not be able to prepare meals for yourself because you have to rest. So someone that could come in and help you with those sorts of things. Um, currently for, and you may have expressed this in your, in your statement, how could a woman be connected to a doula in New York City in 2018, coming from a low-income background in the city of New York? How would that happen? Uh, so typically those happen through referrals, uh, but um, through hospitals, uh, some hospitals are already connected to certain programs. Many of the organizations that are sitting in this room today are working to make sure that they have the type of messaging, the flyers, the branding, uh, and the connectivity to the clinical center. So uh, if any uh, mother, if any woman, uh, if anyone is needing doula services, that they can be connected uh, to a doula. Uh, and again, you know, we have a number of programs that provide doula services. Uh, and so, you know, if, if there's a no wrong door situation that's, that, that is established in networks, like our neighborhood health action centers, uh, like other community centers, even if you're not offering doula services, you can be connected to a program. So if someone comes into our neighborhood health action center in Brownsville, uh, and they are letting someone know that they're planning to have a pregnancy, then they can say, okay, we can connect you to Brooklyn Perinatal Network, they are upstairs, and you can set up a, an appointment. Uh, but and how is it paid for? So the Healthy Woman, Healthy Future initiative is funded by you, by the city council. Uh, and So uh, any and every woman can receive it? Yes, any and every woman can receive it. Yep. But, but, it's, but it's somewhat hit or miss if you're in the right place at the right time to know right. that, it, that it exists. Because I, I would see myself as, in some ways, I never heard of it, I mean, in the sense of going through my own process. I've heard about it through hearings and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But even in hearing about it through hearings and that sort of thing, I still didn't have the, the, the time to be able to go through my papers and look through the folder and pull it out and say, I could go here kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So without that type of, it, it, it seems like if you're at the right place, like if I were in Brownsville and I walked past that center on a regular basis, sure. I'd know to go in there. But if you don't know that, how do you know it? Yeah, no, I, I totally hear that. And there has to be a better system about getting that messaging out. I think the department has worked hard uh, to promote and again amplify the organizations that are providing these services. So either A, they can get a referral, so word of mouth, 
uh, because I think that most of the referrals come from someone that pre previously received doula services through Caribbean Women's Health Association or Brooklyn Perinatal Network or Angel Song Doula, and then they're referred to that uh, to another doula. Uh, and again, through hospitals or if your clinical center is aware of those of those services as well. So we need to really work harder to to create that infrastructure so we can get um, that messaging out. I just have two more questions and I want to turn it back over. I, I, I think what I'm hearing is that from the time a woman understands that she's having a baby, that there has to be some sort of mechanism in place for her to know what all the services that she has available to her that she can utilize right at her fingertips without having to run all over the city to kind of figure out what those particular resources are. Um, in the fiscal 2019 budget, the personnel services budget for maternal and child health totals 11.1 million and supports 176 full-time positions. This represents an increase in headcount of 45 positions when compared to 2018. Can you tell us more about this 34% increase in budget headcount in maternal and child health? Uh, Correct. I'm sorry, I forgot to put on the mic. Um, I'd have to get back to you on some of what that covers, but two things I can tell you very specifically are we received funding, and this came actually from the previous speakers, advocacy and others from city council, um, funding to expand Nurse Family Partnership, which is a home visiting program for low income first time mothers that enrolls families right uh, at the at the, as soon as possible during pregnancy and can follow families until the baby is two years old. And we're now, serve, we, with the expansion, we're gonna be able to serve another over 800 families, which brings our ability to serve to 3,000 per year. And part of the expansion was to increase uh, to three additional, four additional teams. One of them is something in Nurse Family Partnership called our Targeted Citywide Initiative, which prioritizes and focuses actually exclusively on teens who are pregnant and having children who are in foster care, women and teens in shelters who are homeless, and women and teens involved in the criminal justice system or at Rikers Island. And we have a brand new team. We, um, we, are, we are, so that is one piece of that as the hiring of those nurses. We also hired additional teams in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. And we'll be moving, we've been able to remove our zip code restrictions because we know that with the gentrification in New York City, while there are neighborhoods that stand out as the we're overall as the worst outcome, there are pockets of of women of, of people of color throughout the city who often need these services. So a lot of the staffing was hiring more public health nurses. We also um, received funding to expand our newborn home visiting program, which is a para, uh, paraprofessional non-clinical staff who go and make a home visit after the uh, baby is born, and we focus on the neighborhoods where the Neighborhood Health Action Centers are. The expansion was to, in partnership with Homeless Services, offer that visit to every baby born in a shelter. In, uh, and we, we rolled that out over the last two years, so we hired more teams of what are called public health advisors, as well as social workers and nurses to support, to visit, and we've uh, now, in the last year, we looked and we were able to reach 75% of families with babies under two months of age who are residing in shelter to provide services uh, to them in the shelter. So those were the main increases. Uh, there may be others that you're referring to that we can mm -hmm. check uh, to look at specifically what other staff were brought on, but those were the main uh, headcount increases. I just want to close with this question and because I really want to understand the scope of what we're focusing on. So just to be as real about it as you possibly can be. So do we have on staff in terms of trained doula care professionals and that sort of thing to meet the, the need that is, a, that is here in the city of New York? Do we have the actual amount of child care professionals to address a need that we have in terms of um, maternal mortality around issues around giving birth to a healthy child um, from the time that we understand the child's coming into the world to once the child is here. 
or is it that we more so are just, we just have enough resources now to respond to whoever happens to be, for whatever reason, geography, location, circumstances, able to know that the services exist. So there, there are times when you can say, we're not really necessarily promoting this to the world, but we kind of can manage if people find out about us mm -hmm. to provide that level of service. But if we all across the board said every woman that's having a baby in New York City that we know is at risk, we have the services to address that. And if that is the answer, what is it that we actually need in order to be able to provide that? So I'll start, and I know you may want, Dr. Easterly may want to say something as well. No, we do not. There is much, much more that needs to be done. We're, we're proud that we're a city that is doing more in this area. And I have to say, having been at the health department since 2001, and, and I think there is one tremendous alignment and partnership with many of the community partners who are here, some who are not today, around putting the M back in maternal and child health, around focusing on the mother. There's many years where we have focused on babies, and babies are critical but we're finally really seeing the importance of healthy women, healthy people who give birth. We, do, we, there is, we, are at the, we are doing a lot and we're proud of what we are doing, but much more needs to be done. No, not right now we can't. What you described requires a, a number of things, um, and I'll just say generally, but we, you know, we look forward to further discussions on this and being informed by our community partners who are the ones who really raise to us in the community engagement group that's been in place for over three years, this idea of respectful care at birth. Because we had doulas that were part of the community engagement group who were seeing these issues day after day and the need for letting people know about the human right. Because in the United States, we don't have a codified civil right to many of these protections, um, as frankly there are in other countries, some other countries. So we, we need to let people know of their human rights. There's public awareness campaigns. There's education, there's screening of pregnant women around all their needs, not just their medical needs. And um, we, so, so um, and we recently, you can say more about this, thank you, is we recently launched a Here For You campaign that was last fiscal year. Um, that to help people, that was a public awareness campaign to let people know about the services available to pregnant people and to families with infants. But that was one campaign. We need, a lot more at the both citywide but also at the neighborhood level. It's why I think the work of the action centers and other community-based work in neighborhoods where there aren't action centers are needed because people may see a subway campaign and that's critical, but we also need to do community level awareness. So there's awareness raising, there's more services, there's education in the hospitals and neighborhood. We're, I think we know more and more what needs right. to be done, but we need to scale it up and we agree with you. What percentage would you say you feel you're meeting the need? Oh, I th let me get back to you. I don't know that I could quantify it off the top of my head. I think there's, m I, I just need to say generally that there is much more to do than we're doing good work. I'm very proud and there's much more to do. And could you say 25% we feel we're meeting, 50%, 75%? Remaining? Like we, we feel we're addressing 25% of the city's need in terms of women in need that need these types of services, or would you say we're like at 50% or we're like close to 100, but not We really. are not close to 100, I can say that. And I, I'd like to really get back to you with a more, okay. know, with That's a better fair. answer, because I don't, I wanna think about what we can say in terms of where we are compared to what the need is. Thank you. Thank you. We don't officially applaud in the council chamber, but can we do a handshake for council member, majority leader combo? An incredibly powerful, powerful. <laughs> Uh, statement and series of questions. Thank you so much, Majority Leader. It's in in wonderful to have you here. We are next going to go to Health Committee member, Council member, Alika Ampersand. Good morning still, everyone. And I just want to thank the chairs for this powerful hearing because it, it just blends so many of my worlds together clearly as a mother. And thank you, Majority Leader, for your comments and questions. And um, a lot of what I was going to address and say, um, the Majority Leader addressed a lot of it. Um, I am the mother of an amazing son, and I gave birth to him in a hospital here um, in Brooklyn. And um, it was a difficult time 
but because I had an amazing husband and a very aggressive and knowledgeable mother in the room with me, um, I'm just thankful that um, everything worked out because I did bleed out on the table. Everyone had to be rushed out. It was a, a, a traumatic experience for the entire family. But again, because of my loved ones um, being there and able to advocate um, for me when I wasn't able to, um, I don't know where um, I would be today. And having that experience, but then leaving the United States and working for the United States government in developing countries across West Africa, it was interesting to see how we as a country spend so much money on maternal um, and child um, uh, mortality, again, in developing countries. And here it is in the United States, and in particular in New York City, such a wealthy city, we have the numbers that were stated today is, is quite alarming. Um, and I honestly did not know that these numbers existed until um, just recently. And I was doing so much work in developing countries, so it's um, pretty interesting. But, um, and I just want to say um, I appreciate the work that you're doing in Brownsville, Dr. Easterling. And when you talked about um, just looking at families and, and not just a mother and a child, but overall what we can do to wrap our arms around the families as a whole, um, I really do thank you for the work that you're doing because um, the the staff at the Health Action Center will show up at um, shooting responses and looking to see how they can be supportive of the mothers um, to those families. So thank you so much. And we really are taking this to a, a level of um, a true partnership. And I look forward to, to that partnership in this capacity. But I do have a question about the um, Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. Can you explain the work of this office and how this office was established? And in particular, is this office involved with pregnancy-related care at all? Um, so the Office of Faith-Based Initiative is, it a, is an office that's within the Center for Health Equity uh, at the New York City Department of Health. Uh, their primary uh, objectives have been to engage houses of worship, all different faiths, particularly around chronic disease uh, management and uh, prevention. And so they've been doing a lot to implement uh, uh, active transportation, healthy eating programs and houses of worship across the city. Uh, their primary areas uh, in their catchment area is uh, in South Bronx, East Harlem, Central Harlem, as well as Central Brooklyn. Um, and to your, to your specific questions, uh, you know, are they focusing on mothers? Their primary program has been around breastfeeding and increasing uh, both education and awareness uh, to leaders around breastfeeding, uh, and initiation and duration because we see uh, in uh, African-American communities that initiation rates are higher uh, than duration rate, uh, rates uh, as they dip off significantly after the mom is discharged from hospital. Uh, and so they've been going into houses of worship and really working with uh, the leaders uh, to really make sure that uh, their houses of worship are breastfeeding friendly, uh, that they can provide lactation spaces uh, and pumps also for the public as well. And so. That has been their primary focus around engaging community to be supportive and advocates for mothers. Um, but I think that there is definitely more opportunity where definitely around the, uh, with Thrive NYC, there's a connection that they can make to support uh, families around maternal depression, uh, paternal depression, uh, and other adverse experiences that we know exist in communities. And so you think they have the capacity to do that as well? There is capacity. I wouldn't uh, commit to um, to saying that they can take it on at this moment because I think that there are a number of programs that they currently have that they're rolling out, uh, and I think we'll have to do an assessment to see what are some of the programs that they can continue to phase out and begin to take on as well. Okay. Well, I look forward to working with you sure. all on that as well. Thank you. If I could also just jump in. Um, again, in response to uh, Majority Leader Cumbo's very persuasive uh, storytelling herself. Um, you know, the deputy mayor just announced women.nyc, which is a very exciting uh, focus for the city on welcoming women to New York City. But it has nothing on it, and this is just a gentle reminder to um, those that put women.nyc together, a gentle reminder that we should probably put information about doula services, about 
um, you know, search information that should come up when women uh, search for information about their pregnancy and make sure that's integrated into the new resource guide. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And we have. And we will now turn to Councilmember Barron. Did you have questions, Councilmember? Great. Thank you to the chairs for this committee hearing, and thank you to the panel for being here. Uh, I was so pleased to see in your testimony, as I have always seen in the testimony of uh, the department under the leadership of Dr. Bassett, the statement, the acknowledgement of institutional system, systemic racism and its impact. In her book, um, Medical Apartheid, there are references to so many documented instances of women being used experimentally, as with Dr. Sims, for uh, medical, quote, research. I think that, that there are vestiges of that and that there are many in the black community who don't trust the medical profession. We also all know about the uh, syphilis experiments that were done in Tuskegee. So we're talking about training for the medical profession. We're talking about addressing implicit and explicit bias. What are we going to do with the other component, the other facet that talks about the perception based on historical reality that black people have that questions the um, honesty and the integrity of the medical system. Thanks for that question. I just wanted to make sure I understand the, the, the question is the mistrust Yes, that, that, black prevent, that, have has of it, the that has people system. not going to seek medical attention, uh, not trusting that the care that they're getting is adequate, um, hearing instances of um, lack of professionalism and wondering, was it just, not just, was it an instance of someone's lack of medical training or was there some intent? How are we going to address that public? Absolutely. Um, so I think we're starting to address it and it's really at the beginning stages uh, with something I mentioned in the testimony with birth justice defenders and champions. So this is really, our goal is to have people in the community who've given birth or whose loved ones, friends, family have given birth, we have grandmothers involved, who can speak to their experience to educate the providers and, and to help, you know, to sort of bring human being to human being and to hear those stories, to, to speak to what, what, is, what was that experience and for, because it won't just be educate, I mean, I believe in training strongly, but we know that training doesn't necessarily change behavior. That's right. And so we need, that's a beginning step. It's not an end in itself because there need to be, uh, I mean, if people have had a bad experience and word of mouth is that don't go there because you don't get treated well, the institution is then gonna need to show and demonstrate a change that reflects that people are treated differently here. And that's gonna be a culture, a, a culture shift that won't happen overnight. I mean, I speak from our experience working to make ba hospitals baby friendly and uh, to support m people who want to breastfeed. And it took three to four years for most hospitals to make that change. People get used to doing things a certain way, they don't even realize that they're disrespecting people. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's gonna have to be a two-way street. People are going to, we need the voices of community members speaking to and educating. We need providers engaged in, and those hopefully growing numbers who are willing to call out what's not acceptable and what's not, and I think it's gonna have to be proven time and time again for the, for the perception to change because we, we need people to be able to go and, and get the decent, respectful care they deserve. Thank you, and just uh, to comment, uh, I'm so pleased that Brookdale Hospital is reaching out to make sure that we, they spread the message about the advantages of breastfeeding, and my sons are, uh, 35 and 45, and, <laughs> and, but that was back during the 70s and you know, the revolutionary movement, and so I just felt, well, this is the natural thing to do, so I'm gonna breastfeed my sons, and I'm so glad that I did. And I do want to also acknowledge that yesterday, the Brownsville Action Center had a fantastic 
event. It was their second one. It was well attended. It was better than the first one. And the first one was grand and great. And so much information was available. I stopped at, I think, every one of the tables and picked up lots of brochures. So I will be sending your office requests for uh, large quantities of some of the information that I got and compliments for that grand event. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Thank you. Barron, and thank you to the administration. We are now going to move to our next panel, which is going to be outstanding because it's a mix of doulas and a few people who are not doulas but who have babies that they have to leave to take care of. So that's going to be a great mix of voices. And I'm going to start by asking Renat Dre, Michael Bast, Deborah Lassane, Tanya Hardy, and Chanel Portia Albert to please come for the next panel. We have many people who want to testify, so we are going to have a three-minute clock on testimony, but I promise you that we will be very flexible and generous. Uh, we want to hear all of your voices in this important discussion. Is, is there one of you that needed to leave due to child care needs? Okay. Please kick us off. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to say welcome um, to the doulas and the mothers and the advocates in the room. Um, and thank you, City Council, for hearing um, our testimony, or an ancient monk's testimony. So good afternoon and to all and give thanks for joining um, to support a movement towards, towards justice and maternal health. Um, just to give you a little bit of background. This chair is really small. Okay. Ancient Song Dual Services is a Brooklyn-based organization and has actively worked towards bridging racial disparities in maternal health through addressing racial and implicit bias since 2008. <clears throat> We have trained over 300 plus doulas, both locally and nationally, and served over 200 individuals citywide alone last year. Uh, Community-based and cult culturally relevant organizations are crucial in spearheading the fight against the disparities in black maternal mortality and morbidity in New York City, where African-American women are often 12 times more likely to die of a childbirth-related complication or suffer a near miss. Ancient Song stands in favor of the bills proposed today. We would, however, like to stress a couple of crucial areas that can assure an effective implementation of such reform. First, if these bills are to achieve the lasting change they seek, the inclusion of community-based maternal health experts and addressing implicit bias and racism within maternal health outcomes is imperative. While often regarded as a luxury item, doulas of color, particularly community-based doulas, address systemic racism, intergenerational trauma, implicit bias in the birth room, both during and before it happens. As we have seen in recent accounts published by ProPublica's Lost Mother series and Serena Williams, who, accounts, who recounts, while recovering in the hospital, Serena suddenly felt short of breath. Because of her history of blood clots and because she was off <clears throat> of her daily anticoagulant regime due to the recent surgery, she immediately assumed she was having another pulmonary embolism. Serena lives in fear of blood clots. She walked out of the hospital room so her mother wouldn't worry and told the nearest nurse between gasps that she needed a CT scan with contrast of an IV heparin, a blood thinner right away. 
The nurse thought her pain medicine might be making her confused, but Serena insisted, and soon enough, a doctor was performing an ultrasound on her legs. She insisted, I need, I, I was like, I need a Doppler. I told you, I need a CT scan. I need a heparin drip. She remembers telling them. The ultrasound received nothing, so they sent her for a CT, and sure enough, several blood clots had settled in her lungs. Minutes later, she was on a drip, and I was like, listen to Dr. Williams. We have another account of Erica Gardner, a mother of an eight-year-old daughter and a four-month-old son, who was thrust into an activist role against police brutality following the death of her father, Eric Gardner, while in police custody, and who died four months postpartum, and countless other mothers here in the United States whose stories are never told. <coughs> Excuse me. Time and time again, the voices of black women have been ignored within healthcare and continue to be dismissed as an afterthought. Forced coercion into complying with medical procedures by threatening to call Child Protective Services, the continued lack of access to equitable, culturally relevant care, and the co compounded by stress of racism and implicit bias continue to kill us on a daily basis and is showing up in the birth room and during the postpartum period. Over time, organizations such as Ancient Song Dual Services have, provi have been providing community-based doula care to marginalized communities, both on a local and national level, to address these continued injustices. According to Ch Choices in Childbirth, community-based doulas offer ample culturally appropriate support from trained community health workers and primarily serve under-resourced communities with care on a sliding scale as they tailor to specific needs of the community. Community health workers such as doulas are equipped to address di discrimination and disparities through bridging barriers in language and the gaps in culture. Given that pay payment for these community-based services are usually out of pocket, the absence of any reimbursement makes doula care highly inaccessible, especially for families with limited means. In addressing maternal mortality head on, we first must consider all of the factors that limit access to effective maternal health care and can result in such drastic disparities in outcomes. We have to think about food and housing insecurities, the access to cultural humility within that healthcare system. And given that systematic oppression is a social determinant of black high infant and maternal mortality rate within New York City, shifting tasks and responsibilities down the hierarchy of the healthcare system is both necessary and ideal for marginalized communities. For these reasons, the most crucial aspect is free low cost dual services prioritizing the reimbursement of community-based, culturally relevant doula services through Medicaid is key. As these beneficiaries are often those who are affected the most in looking at such disparities within maternal health care system. We ultimately stress that the implementation of Medicaid reimbursement be equitable, community-based, and provide access to a scope of services needed to be adequate to the needs of the consumers. Reimbursement should be nothing less than a rate that is of a living wage. We urge that you use your voice to advocate for community-based doula programs being included in Andrew Governor Cuomo's proposed doula pilot program, which seeks to address racial disparities in maternal health. Without comprehensive inclusion, more after, moreover, community-based stakeholders who are doing the work within maternal health care are doomed to fail before it even gets started. We also have the following recommendations. We call for institutional reform from administration to staffing that provides education on all implicit bias, racial discrimination, and a human rights in childbirth, and human rights framework in childbirth that addresses bodily autonomy, informed consent, and shared de decision making within the reproductive health choices. We call for an accountability measures to be implemented that tracks and monitors institutions and staffing and that allows for consumers and staffing to report implicit bias and discrimination during prenatals, childbirth, and the postpartum period. We call for community members to be seen and incorporated within the review of all proposed healthcare models and those accountability measures. We call for an evidence-based review of all systems of reproductive health care within New York City, in particular, all public and private hospital facilities within areas that exhibit high maternal mortality rates or near misses. And we also call for midwifery care to be incorporated as a viable system in addressing racial disparities and implicit bias, and Medicaid reimbursement for those services be at a living wage regardless of where the patient decides to birth. 
In addition, certified professional midwives be seen as an additional resource in addressing the shortages of midwives within New York City. So I leave you all with the words of Audrey Lord that when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcome. But when we are silent, we are, we are still afraid. So it's better to speak. And we will continue to do so until racial disparities within healthcare and implicit bias are addressed within New York City. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chanel. And we, we appreciate that very powerful, yes, powerful. We, we do remind folks that our custom here to express support is to waive uh, just a little bit of decorum. Um, technically, we need to ask you to state your name for the record. Oh. So, Chanel. Uh, my name is Chanel Porsche Albert. I'm the founder and executive director of Ancient Song Dual Services, and we are located in Brooklyn, New York. Excellent. And we have been joined by our colleague on the Health Committee, Councilmember Dr. Matthew Eugene. And uh, I, I do want to ask folks to bear in mind we have a lot of people who are testifying. And so um, if I jump in to ask you to summarize if you're over time, please understand it's just that we want to hear from everybody. And then I'll ask you to please take it away. Much better now. Good morning. Uh, I'm Michael Bast. I'm a medical malpractice lawyer. I have an office on Court Street in Brooklyn, and I've been practicing law for about 40 years. I have never seen a case like the one I'm about to tell you now, the case of Renat Dre. Uh, Councilwoman Rosenthal mentioned the need to listen to women, listen to them tell their stories. Ms. Barron also mentioned um, that people, people are not uh, aware of what's going on uh, and not listening to their, 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 their patients. Many times in the past, prospective clients would come into my office seeking representation, and they would tell me a story that goes like this. I was nine months pregnant. I went into the hospital to deliver my baby. And the doctor gave me a C-section even though I didn't want it. I'd say, well, isn't that something? That's a bad thing. Fine, bring in the medical records, and we'll take a look, and we'll see if, if that's enough to make a case or not. And a few months later, the woman would bring in the hospital records, and we'd look at it. And there would always, always be an entry reading, after much discussion with the patient and her husband, patient agreed to a cesarean section. And there in the record, the woman's signature appears on the consent form. Then the prospective clients would say, and they badgered me, and they threatened me, and they made me sign that consent form, but I really didn't want it. And I would have to explain, I'm sorry, this is not a winnable case because the jury's gonna hear you consented, you're going to lose. Thanks for coming in. And the woman would say, but what about this gruesome scar I have? I almost died. What about this infection? What about my lacerated bladder? And I would say, I'm sorry, but those are considered a risk of the procedure. A risk of the procedure, meaning Women who have C-sections, they get injured. You consented. The women who come into my office are telling the truth about what they wanted and about what happened to them. But I wouldn't take their cases, and neither would anybody else. Then in January of 2014, Renat Dre walked into my office with a statute of limitations about to expire and the medical records in her hand. She had a similar story but this time, it was in writing. In July of 2011, she had been forced to have a C-section against her will at Staten Island University Hospital. The medical record said, in the doctor's own handwriting, the woman has decisional capacity. I have decided to override her refusal to have a C-section, and her attending doctor and the hospital attorney are in agreement. And that's what they did. They wheeled her in to the operating room over her objection. What? How is this possible? How could this be? 
Not only did a doctor admit to performing a surgery without consent, but the hospital general counsel agreed to it? Isn't this America? Can someone be forced to have major abdominal surgery without at least a court order? And, and Mr. Bass, we, we, we very much value hearing the story. If I can actually to wrap it up, or perhaps, I don't know if Ms. Dre is speaking herself, just because we're over time, we have so many people who want to speak. Very well. The case is still litigation, and we don't know how it's going to come out, but I did bring with me Renat Dre, who's going to tell her own story, what happened to her. Thank, thank you. Ms. Dre? Just turn on the mic, we'll see the red dot, and state your name for the record. Okay, my name is Renat Dre. My de date of birth is April 10, 1979. Uh, at the time of the event, uh, I was 32 years old. Uh, I, live, I lived with my husband. And, and if you can just speak directly into the mic, we're having a hard time hearing. Okay. But also, you they're should gonna, know they're we. They're going to flip out at the time. You're just going to have to tell the story. <coughs> about from when you first became pregnant. Hang on one second, uh, yeah. sir. Hang on one second. Ma'am, I want to welcome you to the chambers. Thank I you. can't tell you how much I appreciate your being here. You're sharing your story. It's powerful, really powerful for us to hear it. Thank so feel comfortable. We're all on your side. This is not any, this does not have to do with your lawsuit or any litigation. This is simply the public wanting to know what happened to you, what your experience was, and how you felt about it. Don't, no one's, uh, there's, you know, you can feel really, com you're in a safe space. And um, you don't even have to read anything. Just tell us from your heart what happened. So I just uh, uh, have had a very uh, bad experience uh, with my first uh, two pregnancies with um, um, doctors uh, pushing me to do a C-section, which I wasn't happy with that later on. I had very hard recoveries. So in my third um, pregnancy, when I had... Um, uh, I was looking for a hospital and a doctor which will allow me to do a uh, VBAC after the two previous um, experience I had, which was very bad. Um, and then I, I researched the topic, I compared the risk of a C-section, a repeat C-section, compared to a VBAC, <coughs> and I... Uh, I checked it out and I just I read that uh, it's much, I mean, I decided that's much better choice for me to try for a VBAC. I went to um, one hospital. Uh, at the beginning of the pre my third pregnancy, I, I was going to a hospital, which I found out that they didn't allow to try after two, ces two caesareans to try for a VBAC. So when I found out that they, they don't allow it, I left that hospital and I looked for, for a different hospital and a doctor which will allow me to try to have a vaginal birth. Uh, so I found that the, the hospital the, of Staten Island University um, allow a trial of uh, a VBAC after two previous uh, caesarean. Uh, and, um, and the doctor, uh, which allowed to try, try to, which was na his name was uh, Dr. Dory. He was uh, instructing me what should I do to get the, to I mean to get the best chances uh, to have uh, vaginal birth after previous uh, caesareans. And um, um, uh, I mean, I did everything. He said, I, um, following a certain diet, he said, and on um, um, July 25, 2011, about a week after my estimated due date, I felt contractions, 
We called the ambulance, and she took me to Staten Island University Hospital. It was exam examined and found to be only two centimeters dilated. I decided to return home and to labor at home. The next morning on July 26, I had more contractions, and I suspected my water had broken. I called my doula. I hired the, I hired the doula in order to, to help me and support me that I would get the, to have a natural birth. And my contraction became more intense, and together with my mother, we went to the hospital in, in an ambulance. We arrived to emergency room around 8 o'clock. My regular OBGYN, Dr. Dory, was not there. Another physician from his practice group, Dr. Gorelick, examined, examined me. Uh, uh, the tria triage nurse told me that I was three centimeters dilated, 90% a face, and the baby's head was in minus two or minus three station. She said the contractions were strong, coming three minutes apart. The baby's heartbeat was doing well. I also learned that my water had not yet broken. Dr. Gorelick immediately told me to have a cesarean section. He didn't, he didn't give much explanation. He just said, you had, you had two previous cesarean, so you should have another one. I responded by telling him that I researched the VBAC and I knew that, I'm have, that having cesarean, having, having risks to I considered returning home again with my doula to continue my, my labor there. When Dr. Duralik heard this, he became <coughs> upset and said, okay, go home and rupture your uterus at home. He gave me an ultimatum. He said, either you have a cesarean now or you go home at AMA against medical advice. He told me, if you leave, you shouldn't come back. I didn't like the way Dr. Duralik was treating me, making threats, and giving me ultimatums. I didn't want to stay at the hospital. Rinat, toda. At me Israel, nachon. At madima, pashut madima. Ani rosel lo dod lach al omet shelach, veshe hayit poitano. Ze mamash chashuv. Thank you. Mamash chashuv. Toda, toda raba. Uh, just was just briefly um, saying how Shabbat. amazing Renat is and how much we support her and yeah. how much her bravery has come through uh, in her testimony and in your long fight and yeah. and, we, and we support you on that thank you you know if I could just ask I, I think uh, for the purposes of this hearing it's very clear uh, that, as you said, women need to be listened to and that women's choices are imperative um, with, if, it, if, it's, if it's okay and, and so as not to pain you. Um, we have your written testimony, we understand what you're talking about. Um, you know, the, the the next speaker um, is also talking about the issue of listening to women's choices. Um, would it, with, with deepest respect and mm -hmm. heartfelt appreciation of you, um, are we okay? Do you, is there one final statement you'd like to make or may we turn it over to the next speaker who also is going to be speaking about the importance of listening to women and choices. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that I was treated really, really bad. Um, and uh, I was forced into something I didn't want to. And uh, there was no really reason to behave this way. It's just, uh, and uh, the reason he told me is just, he said, uh, he doesn't have, that he doesn't have the whole day for me for me. I uh, also was um, trying to scare me, is the, uh, the state going to take my child, using all kind of scary tactics and forcing me into C-section without the consent, which was really, really bad. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry for what happened to you, and I appreciate your coming here today. Thank, um, you. thank you. Thank you. Please. Good morning. I just would like to say to, to you that your story is known throughout all of New York City. 
we know about what happened to you, and we appreciate that you are highlighting this issue for all to know. And we all support you. You have support of many women in New York City. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. If you could just state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Deborah Lassane, and I am the Director of Programs at the Caribbean Women's Health Association, also known as CWHA. I am also a member of the New York City Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee, which was recently established by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm here today to express my support for both bills. I'm going to cut short my testimony to allow others to speak. CWHA is located in the Flatbush community of Brooklyn, and we've been providing support to pregnant and parented women for more than 30 years. It's ironic that CWHA was established 30 years ago specifically to meet the needs of pregnant women from the Caribbean who did not have access to adequate prenatal care and who were experiencing high rates of poor birth outcomes, including miscarriages, premature births, and infant deaths. Over the years, our services have expanded to include um, additional services such as HIV education and um, immigrant legal assistance. Um, we still have a particular focus on the central Brooklyn communities of Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brownsville, and East New York. During the last two years, CWHA provided breastfeeding education and additional support services to more than 250 pregnant women and their families. In addition, CWHA coordinates doula support services to the residents of Manhattan and the Bronx as part of the Healthy Women, Healthy Futures initiative, which is funded by the New York City Council. Thank you, New York City Council. We are a citywide initiative providing free doula support before, during, and after birth in the most high need areas of New York City. Healthy Women, Healthy Futures also provides free doula training to low-income women from the five boroughs. This is the fourth year the Healthy Women, Healthy Futures has been funded and operational. Each year, a new cohort of community-based women, predominantly women of color, receive birth doula training, postpartum doula training, or both. To date, the Healthy Women, Healthy Futures initiative has been responsible for training more than 200 New York City resident doulas. The citywide Healthy Futures initiative is coordinated by CWHA, the Brooklyn Perinatal Network, and the Community Health Center of Richmond. I'm going to skip a few things. I just want to um, state that I would also like to see more focus on severe maternal morbidity. It was mentioned earlier. The community districts in New York City with the highest severe maternal morbidity rates are in Brooklyn, all in Brooklyn, Brownsville, East Flatbush, and East New York. Newly arrived women from the Caribbean, Central American, and Africa have higher severe maternal morbidity rates than the immigrant women who have been living in the U.S. for more than a year. My recommendations to address many of the issues stated today is that the New York City Council and the New York City Department of Health should increase the overall number of trained doulas in New York City with a particular focus on training doulas who can appropriately support the Caribbean, Central American, and African immigrant communities. In addition, the New York City Council and New York City Department of Health should also provide for birth education to all women in New York City, childbirth education. This is to address the issue that was brought up by Council Member Combo. Women simply don't know what their options and choices are. Women don't know what a doula is. We need to make more effort to provide more resources to providing this information to women so that they can know what resources are available. I'd also like to recommend um, better coordination between community-based services and hospital clinicians so that the women in the hospital receiving care in the hospital and the clinicians in the hospital know what resources are available to women in the community and can provide um, direction to women who are receiving care. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. If I can just jump in, I really appreciate your testimony um, in support of more doulas. Um, and for everyone for coming today, taking the time. Thank you. Thank you to this great panel. We truly appreciate your perspective. <laughs> and we have our next panel, which I think is also going to be very powerful. 
We have Dr. Lisa Nathan. We have Patricia James, Helena Grant, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing, I can't read the handwriting, but Ann Gibeon from Jacoby Medical Center. Dr. Nathan, did, did you want to kick us off? Please. Sure. Can you, is this on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Nathan. I am an assistant professor and MFM specialist, high risk obstetrician at NYU Langone Health in Brooklyn. I also serve as a consultant um, doing maternal death case abstractions for the New York City um, Department of Health. So thank you all for having me and allowing me to discuss this important issue that I feel incredibly passionate about. Um, I'm going to skip straight to the question of why, since we've heard a lot about the actual problem. Um, addressing why there are such stark racial disparities in maternal outcomes in this wealthy country of ours is a, a big question and it's difficult to answer, of course. I agree with others that the disparities come to exist are due to a complex interplay of three main factors, patient, provider, and system level factors. And due to the complex complexity of the problem and the interplay between all of these factors, I don't think there's ever gonna be an easy solution, nor will there ever be a single solution that in isolation is gonna serve the, solve the problem. We have to address all of these issues simultaneously to actually see the change that we're hoping to achieve. It's clear, of course, that we have to start with increasing access to quality health insurance, a big problem that we all face, in order to provide a strong foundation for increasing access. But we know that access to care does not always translate into utilization of care, because utilization of care is a complicated issue in and of itself. There are social determinants, other patient-level factors that come into play. In addition, culturally competent, compassionate, unbiased, and patient-centered care is a provider factor that we also know is severely lacking and also does play a role in the, a role in the patient continuing care with that provider and adhering to any um, plan that's been laid out. Disturbingly, as we've all been talking about, we know that there's more and more evidence of the overt and subconscious uh, racism that's playing a factor in patient care and adherence to plans as well as outcomes. And that implicit bias exists amongst healthcare professionals, I think is inescapable, but to think that it might compromise care being provided to the most vulnerable patients is just truly unacceptable. And I think implicit bias awareness and training is an essential component of what we need to address. In my years of work in this city, I can also attest to the fact that it's critical to improve the quality of the actual medical care that's being provided to these women from the preconception period through the postpartum uh, period. Physicians also need regular structured training sessions in the major obstetric emergencies so that when an emergency happens, it's recognized quickly and it's managed efficiently. Research has shown that nearly half of all cases of severe maternal morbidity and maternal deaths are actually preventable, exemplifying the fact that quality of care provided is a critical piece that needs to be addressed as well. Where I work in Brooklyn, we work with an incredibly diverse, linguistically, culturally, racially. Um, uh, the patient population there is very challenging in many ways. We deliver over 4,500 women a year, and we are regularly providing simulation-based training to all of our staff, as well as requiring that implicit bias training um, is completed by all staff members as well. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. I'd love to address any questions you might have. Thank you so much. If I could just ask the Sergeant in Arms to close the door in the back. Um, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Annie Dubow. I'm currently um, the practice director for the midwifery practice at Jacoby Medical Center, where I've been for over 25 years. I'm also the local representative um, for the downstate region for the New York State Association of Licensed Midwives, and I'm pleased to be speaking today in favor of um, 
uh, number uh, bill number 194, which is uh, amending the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to reporting on maternal mortality. So I would just like to um, lend my support and consistent until my arms are aching agreement with the testimony brought forth. So I'm, as Dr. Nathan said, I'm going to jump right to it. Um, in considering um, amending uh, uh, the, the maternal mortality uh, review board, um, we have a couple different thoughts. Certainly, um, we need to have coordination between what's going on on the state level to the city level. So we would ask, for example, that there be consideration um, as congruence of time period. So currently, what is recommended in this bill is that pregnancy-related mortality and morbidity be at 42 days, and on the state level, it's actually defined as up to a year. Um, and also, um, we also think that it's important that actually there be also direct and consistent communication between what's going on at the state level with what's going on at the city level because that communication will lead to transparency and also just help us to understand fully the, the issue across the, sta the state of New York which will inform what goes on here at the city. Um, you can read this later, you can read this later. Um, I think we also think that there are some several different issues that need to be addressed. Number one, the inclusion of, commu of community members in this process is critical in order to include different views, approaches, and questions to better understand the roots of this reality. Um, we know that people who are part of the community understand the sensibility of the community related to health care, um, and certainly health care in the New York City is in is true in most of the United States, is dominated by the medical model of care um, and what has been lacking in the formulation and the implementation of healthcare policy and programs is indeed the input of uh, the women, the families, the pregnant individuals for which those specific policies and programs are um, meant to serve. Um, many women in New York City do not perceive that they have control over how their health care is provided and add to that the identified concerns regarding perceptions of disrespectful and discourteous care. Um, so this deleterious approach to health care delivery has a strong and negative effect as we've heard. Um, and so we ask that the report as it is um, conceptualized include also for example an understanding of the kind of care that women have received in relation to its uh, the fact that it is evidence-based and where it sits in terms of the continuum of best practices um, that we also understand that um, that there are communities in New York who are very mobile and that not only should the borough of residents be elucidated but also the place of birth so for example I care for women many women who are in the shelter system and they're with me because they were placed in a shelter in the Bronx and next thing I know they're coming from Coney Island to see me so and they want to birth in the Bronx um, and we think that that's also important additionally HIPAA requirements are stated in the amendment to protect the privacy of the women um, but considering New York City's um, litigious environment um, it's essential that there be complete unbiased and effective reviews on the part of members of the committee and we need to understand what the protections are for the committee members and uh, lastly um, emerging issues in terms of review of maternal morbidity and mortality are emerging across the country for example including assessment of maternal mental health suicide and substance use disorder and we ask that this committee um, attend to and report on these emerging issues as well as things that come up through review of the population. So I thank you and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Yep. Good afternoon now. <laughs> I'm Helena Grant. I'm the director of midwifery at um, the NYU School of Medicine Woodhall of the Affiliate Division. Um, and I am also a member of the New York State License Association of Midwives, and I'm also a professor at Concordia College for a class called Spiritual and Cultural Concepts of Nursing, and I am one of the three midwives that sits on the New York City DOH's um, Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee. Um, I s sit here today in support of um, both bills um, for trained, qualified doula care for all women in this great city of New York. Um, as a midwife that has served various communities in New York City for 21 years, um, I want to say that um, midwives and other obstetric providers and specialties um, are all needed as a hands-on approach um, along with doula care in a synergistic way. Midwives and doulas actually do have very similar philosophies and have long worked together as members of the same team. Um, as mentioned so many times today and as need to be mentioned because of the evidence that conclusively dem demonstrates that women of color, especially black women, have a risk of 12 times of their white um, counterparts. We do need this all hands 
on deck approach to ensure that maternity care experiences become one where women are given the opportunity to access information and resources in the form of this helping hearts and helping hands approach outside of the hospital, the clinic, the private office walls that the women themselves can bring inside with them and as well to be received with respect and a willingness to listen and shift the trajectory of these statistics. Um, doula care, especially when the doulas represent the communities being served, become not only continual care support specialists, but an invaluable resource and insight to things that are non-clinical, that the client may be experiencing that affect and affect her pregnancy and birth experience. Important port here on the assessment of need, although doulas, as we said, are not medically trained and do not replace the clinical expertise of midwives or physicians, they are absolutely invaluable. Evidence shows that they decrease C-section rates by 50%, the length of labor, the use of oxytocin and epidurals. Um, there was a question earlier about statistics, a 2014 study surveyed that nationwide only 6% of women reported the use of doula care, and even midwifery care only stands nationwide um, after about 10%. Uh, many of the women's women are not aware of the benefits of either. And with this in mind, as been has been brought up before, I would ask that the council not actually evaluate the de demand as a prelude to need. I instead ask that the work be done to remove bar barriers to women being made aware of these evidence-based resources and statistics so that they can be empowered to speak to their need and that government agencies become information and care conduits for families that seek um, parenthood for all women. Um, one of the primary goals, as mentioned, is for doulas to enhance the woman's emotional um, health and her positive ex, um, experience in birth. Um, and this is achieved through home visits during pregnancy, postpartum, phone visits, on care, presence, um, reassurance during labor. And this is a care bundle that whether we practice in the hospital or the private sector, practicing midwi mid 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 midwives and obstetrics have to admit we are not offering this to women, and especially those women who are perceived um, to garner the most benefit. Um, on the uh, issue of availability to about free and low cost doulas, I would also submit to the council that the words free and low cost be actually removed because during my 21 years as a practicing midwife, many times I have witnessed one doula hired by a woman come back and forth over the course of a three day medical induction and stay nonstop for 18 hours once the labor became established. And so in the public health um, service, especially women need need the same equitous doula care that their counterparts who can afford it um, have. Um, and so I went through some statistics about rates in here that can be read, and I just want to say, very much like midwifery, women that have access to doula care rate their experience um, positively, um, and women need to know that doulas, midwives, obstetrics, um, obstetricians that provide them with respective um, um, information and individualized care are available to them, and thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia James. I am a registered nurse working at Helton Hospitals for over 30 years, and I am also on the NISNA Executive Committee, representing over 9,000 nurses. Thank you for allowing me to address you here today. Thank you to the chairs of these committees, Mark Levine and Helen Rosenthal. Rosenthal for highlighting this very important issue. I want you to know that the 9,000 nurses of health and hospitals stand ready to work with you to do what we can to support the expansion of midwife services and reporting on maternal mortality in our hospital and facilities. That's why we support Intro 914. Our goal is to help develop and implement strategies to reduce maternal mortality and maternal health disparities in New York City. Despite the recent trend of a global decline in maternal deaths, the U.S. maternal mortality ratio has increased. And I'm not going to go over this because we've heard of the maternal mortality rate over and over again during this session. Significant racial disparities in maternal death persist in both New York City and New York State, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Maternal death ratios among black women are three to four times higher than among white women. Race is not the cause of health inequities, 
When you see inequities in health, think about systems because systems create inequities. Access to safe, affordable housing, a living wage, education, and healthy food are social determinants that can lead to chronic stress. Stress affects physical and emotional health and can foster unhealthy behaviors that produce health consequences. To improve maternal health and the health of women of color, it requires institutional transformation. The public hospital system leaders, families, and providers have the power to operationalize equity and decrease preventable maternal death and improve the quality of, quali the the quality of health care. Illinois Representative Robin Kelly announced a bill earlier this year that aims to save more women from dying during early pregnancy or childbirth. The bill title, The Mothers and Offspring Maternal and Morbidity Awareness, MAMA Act, addressing racism in the health. Many midwives focus not only on maternity care, but also on the full range of health needs throughout life. Certified nurse midwives provide care from your first period until after menopause, plus all the important health events in between before a woman can start a pregnancy that's healthy, she must be healthy herself. Providers have to open a dialogue about health, about healthy lifestyles, about family planning, about pre-existing conditions, about concerns, for example, comorbidity is the presence of one or more additional disease or disorders co-occurring with a primary disease or disorder. The additional disorder may be a behavior or mental disorder. Mental health conditions increase accidental deaths, suicide and homicide when untreated. These deaths may or may not be included in current data for maternal mortality. Pregnancy-related deaths can be caused by hemorrhage, cardiovascular and coronary conditions, cardiomyopathy or infections. Many pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. Opioid use has been identified as having an impact on maternal mortality. Mothers in jail do not have access to adequate health care, those who are in there for the opioid use. Factors that contribute to the death included lack of patient knowledge on warning signs, provider misdiagnosis, and lack of coordinating between providers. In 2018, it is time to train health care providers to properly listen and assess patient complaints in order to effectively diagnose and treat properly. I believe access to Medicaid for a year following giving birth would help mothers to remain healthy. Midwives work with other members of the healthcare team, such as physicians and nurses, which reduces fragmentation in care. They work in a variety of settings, such as hospitals, medical services, clinical birth centers, and homes. They provide general healthcare services, gynecology care, and family planning, as well as maternity care, before, during, and after childbirth. Health and Hospital has an outstanding midwifery program at North Central Bronx Hospital. We urge you to learn more about that program. Significant strides in addressing maternal mortality in New York have been made recently. However, significant deficits and inequities remain. We must improve and standardize data collection by incorporating data on race and geography, conducting better analysis on the stress responses toward racism, accepting Medicaid in all hospitals, training and educating providers, and conducting research on pre-disease pathways and on connections between maternal and infant death. I thank you again. Thank you very much. And I will say on behalf of uh, my family, it was nurses who, who rescued um, my children when they were born. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to ask really quickly, because we have two more panels to get to, and I want to give everyone a fair shot at talking. So just very, very short answers. In your uh, experience, have any written materials or ex ex explanation been given to um, mothers about doula services or about um, the availability of midwives? Does that happen in the place that you work? Yeah. So at Woodhall Hospital, we are a facility that is all midwives and um, um, certified MDs as well. 
And because we have a midwifery service, we are very integrated into the community and we often do referrals to places like Ancient Song and Doula um, by my side because the midwifery community and the doula community is so um, well integrated. The, the patient population who comes to Woodhall and who comes to Jacoby and who comes to North Central Bronx, they know that midwives are there. A lot of them um, have researched midwives. A lot of them use midwives or pateras in their countries. And so they come and they seek um, the, the service. And the hallmark in these places is that there's no woman that does not get a midwife if she wants one. Um, with, 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 the, the, there's a misnomer that midwives only take care of low-risk women. Um, midwives take care of all women. And really, the model needs to be moved to mid, um, patients and women and people accessing these other high-risk care services as they need it. So in other words, they don't risk out of midwifery care. They risk into the other things that they, we, they need. And that way, we create a synergy, a synergy between the team, between the midwife, between the physician, between the nurses, and between the doulas. We're bringing the inside out and the outside in and really creating a team collaboration to give women the best that every specialty has to offer. I appreciate that. I'm afraid we have to move on to other panels. Thank you all so much for your time. Next up we have Alice Bufkin from Citizens Committee for Children, Nankululeko Taihemba from the Harlem Birth Action Committee, Savannah Brown from Black Women's Blueprint. Okay, thank you. Welcome, please. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, chairpersons, for this meeting and for this hearing and for community who has shown up to the space. Um, my name is Savannah Brown, and I represent Black Women's Blueprint. Um, I am a survivor of child sexual abuse. Um, child sexual abuse impacts over 67% of black women and girls before the age of 18. Some form of sexual trauma um, is experienced. Um, and that is from our research that we conducted in 2013. Um, and for those 67% of black women and girls who are survivors of sexual trauma, they go on to become um, mothers, to become pregnant people, um, like myself. And the day that I learned that I was pregnant, I was actually at Ancient Song Doula Services. So I was in tribe, I was with a village of doulas um, and midwives. And I knew from that very moment that I was not going to go to a public hospital in New York City. I was not even going to go to the birthing center. I knew that I was going to birth at home with a midwife, with a doula, for fear of obstetric violence, fear of non-consensual medical intervention, fear of birth trauma or use of force on behalf of medical staff and physicians, of triggers, of post-traumatic stress disorder, and that should never happen. A woman in New York City, a New York City resident, should never decide that they will not go or walk into a public hospital because they are a survivor of trauma and fear of re-traumatization and re-victimization. And so it is my call to action and my charge that doulas and midwives and medical practitioners um, all come together and be trained in the, in the lens of survivor-led and tra trauma-informed care, maternal care, so not just respectful care, but trauma-informed care, so that women and laboring people do not leave the hospital um, feeling re-traumatized or re-victimized as a result. And so it's really the intersection of sexual violence and reproductive health and maternal health um, that needs to be amplified in our efforts to train around this movement, birth justice movement, that considers the rights of all women and laboring people and looks at reproductive justice holistically. Doulas decrease stress, nutritional instability, lack of childbirth education, and shift the culture of care within birthing facilities every day and night in New York City, where birth trauma impacts the lives of women and pregnant people. 
And those trauma echoes, those triggers and those memories are experiences that come up for pregnant survivors um, that are related to their sexual assault and their experiences with ongoing violence. And many women in their prenatal, during their prenatal time are also experiencing sexual violence and intimate partner violence. And that impacts birth outcomes and maternal mortality. And it is with access to doulas and more midwives that this impact of trauma on the body and the health of birthing persons can be managed and addressed to benefit the supporting pregnant people and their communities. And so it is with gratitude that I'm here to testify and share my own story of a healthy birth outcome that I had at home with a home birth midwife. And I understand that that is not the privilege of every woman in New York City, um, but that we can move towards that culture of care. And with highest esteem to Nankululeku, who I'm sharing this space with, and I cannot wait to hear her remarks as well. Thank you so much. My goodness, that was very powerful testimony. Thank you. Thank you, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alice Bufkin. I'm the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health with Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Um, thank you very much for holding this really important uh, hearing today. Um, we also appreciate DOHMH's ongoing uh, commitment to addressing birth equity and reducing, reducing racial disparities in infant maternal health outcomes. Um, as DOHMH and the City Council consider um, strategies for addressing maternal mortality, um, we do urge increased attention to the impact that federal immigration policies will have on maternal health. Um, we've already heard anecdotal evidence of um, immigrants due to public charge changes that are potentially coming down the pipeline or other issues foregoing really essential health benefits because out of fear. Um, so we really um, do urge the City Council, the administration, and DHMH to invest in additional outreach and direct services to immigrant populations. Um, Again, we're, we very much thank the, the committee for holding today's oversight hearing. Um, I wanted to address both of the bills today, which we, we very strongly support. Um, we strongly support the goals of Intro 914 and feel the establishment of the Maternal Mortality Review Board was a critical step towards addressing the, high, uh, the city's high maternal mortality rates. We hope it will be provided with adequate resources to really intensify and strengthen its efforts. Um, we do want to echo the, the issue that was raised by DOHMH earlier today just to make sure that you know, as um, additional data is being examined, it does protect the confidentiality of the individuals who are part of that study. Um, CCC also strongly supports Intro 913. We have heard extensively just now on this panel repeatedly about the value of doulas and the enormous impact they can have on women uh, in the city. Um, so, uh, you know, um, despite the, their benefits, we know that access to doulas remains out of reach for many of the most vulnerable women in the city, including low-income women and women of color. Um, we're very pleased that the governor is looking at expanding Medicaid for um, doula services, but we don't yet know how that will roll out in practice. And we also want to make sure that we are really supporting community-based doulas as we're looking at how Medicaid reimbursement will work. So um, in our support for this bill, we do have a couple of recommendations. One, to echo what others have said, um, we urge continued and committed collaboration with community stakeholders to help inform um, the City Council's recommendations. Um, this includes the voices of community-based doulas who are actively working in with, within high-risk communities and have close ties to the clients and communities that they serve. Um, and one of the challenges that we do hear from doulas is that there can be some uh, sort of lack of collaboration sometimes with um, uh, nurses, with um, providers um, who may not know enough about doulas. And so um, we would um, ask consideration of including as part of the doula study, really looking at hospital practices and what the attitudes are towards doulas. Um, and knowing about that might help foster better collaboration between doulas, nurses, physicians, and other uh, medical providers. Um, so again, thank you very much for this hearing today. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Nun Kuleko Tayehemba, and I'm celebrating my 52nd anniversary as a registered nurse and a, my 33rd anniversary as a midwife, a certified nurse, mid, a certified midwife. Um, I, I live in a community where um, hospitals are failing black women. Um, I spent my, my entire life, uh, working life, uh, passionately involved with, with women, uh, with, with, with women. Um, and as you know that women, black women are, are dying three, to th three times the rate of white women. That's not important. It was, what's important is that women are dying. Women are dying, babies are dying. And then I'm beginning, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder in a sense, and I'm sort of talking off my notes and I'll, I'll get back to them, but 
I've become more passionate as, I'm, as, I'm, as, I've, as I've been here. Um, I'm really, really concerned um, that we don't lose sight of the importance of the family. Um, and I think there should be, uh, I, I support the, um, the both bills, but I also support the importance of teaching the family members like we used to do, like Aunt Mary and, and Miss Bessie, whoever, whoever their family members were in terms of this, the, this, the, the doula, uh, 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 in, in, in terms of the doula, um, we, we need midwives as well. We, we need doulas, but we also need, we need more midwives. I don't think um, New York uh, or this country itself is as friendly as it should be in, term, in terms of uh, mid midwives. Um, it's been proven that midwives have been key to maintaining successful, healthy births. And as we speak, as we speak right now, Women across the country are being threatened, they're being coerced, they're being manipulated uh, into making decisions that put them at, 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 um, at, at, at a high risk of, of dying of pregnancy-related childbirth. And we need a revolution, not with guns, but with minds and with attitudes and, and, and a, 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 new, a, a new way of thinking about how Babies, mothers, women should, should, be, should be treated in, in, in this country. As the director of the Harlem Birth Action Committee, we've spent many, many years in educating uh, women in our community, uh, working with mothers and families to instill a culture that celebrates birth as a natural process. One of the, the now I'll end with this statement, one of the major things that I see taking place in the um, maternal mortality is the fact that um, another cause for pregnancy-related mortality is, is an institutionalized racism. I mean, is it, you know, is, is it more than just what we, is it fashionable now to say, okay, it's, it's okay now, uh, a, a high mortality in Texas. And, and I've been to different, I, I, I go, I volunteer in different countries um, and where I, and where I go, for, I was in uh, Texas last month, and I was told that in Texas has the highest m m mortality rate. Then I go to California, highest rate there. So it's almost like we're in a race to, to have the highest rate of all for maternal, maternal uh, mortality, maternal morbidity. And we, we're going to have to, this, this, is, this is 2018. This is not 18, uh, Quitting. So I, I'm just hoping that um, that what, what I've said has m made some sense, and that we, we that we sort of work towards doing more than than just okay. Now it's okay to, re to report. Um, the, 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 well, after we, the reporting, after the, the woman is murdered, then what do we do after that? If we just report that um, Mary Jones died on April 5th. Uh, she died of hemorrhage, or whatever the case might be. Is, is, that, is, that, is that where we're in there? Will there be a court? Will there be uh, um, anything after that? Um, and I, I just sort of wonder. Um, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Um, each one more powerful. Each one very, very powerful. And I think that everything you're calling for is common sense. It's true. Um, common sense. And the way people are treated in, in the hospital. Um, I just really want to, I, I'm a little bit speechless, I'm sorry. I, there's nothing to say. Thank you for coming to testify. Um, really, we are hearing everything that you. you are talking about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I second those remarks, and we're going to move on to our final panel. And that will consist of Dr. Sharon Griffith from Community Healthcare Network, Lindsay Dubois, also from CHN, Kylan Greer from Girls for Gender Equity, and Brittany Brathwaite, also from Girls for Gender Equity. And to those of you who have remained with us throughout this incredibly powerful and important hearing. Uh, 
even though the chamber is no longer full, everything that you're testifying to today will be recorded, it's being live streamed, it'll be available on video, it'll be transcribed, and it's an important part of the record today and one which will undoubtedly help us make the case for this legislation and for <laughs> tackling this problem. So we're grateful to all of you for, um, for your remarks today and, and ask you to take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Chairperson Rosenthal, Levine, members of the council and the audience. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. My name is Dr. Sharon Griffith. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and the director of Women's Health Community Healthcare Network, also known as CHN. CHN is a nonprofit network that is a federal qualified health center, two school-based health centers and a fleet of mobile vans. We provide comprehensive services including primary care, prenatal care, behavioral health, and social services to over 85,000 New Yorkers. 30 years ago, CHN was established as a family planning clinic. Approximately seven years ago, we added to our network two centers that were originally maternal, infant, and child centers in Jamaica, Queens, and Tremont in the Bronx. Comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and prenatal care has always been the core of our mission. Today, we provide prenatal care to approximately 2,000 patients. The majority of our patients that are prenatal are of Hispanic or African-American race or ethnicity. Over 75% of our patients have Medicaid-based uh, insurance. One quarter of our patients have a primary language other than English. Our patients give birth at partner hospitals throughout the city and are encouraged to return to us for prenatal care and well baby visits. At CHN centers, we care for patients of low obstetrical risk as well as collaborate with partner hospitals, maternal fetal units to prefer patients for clinically recognized high obstetrical risk. As previously stated, maternal mortality in, mortality in New York City represents approximately 4% of maternal deaths. And we already know the statistics that black women are disproportionately more affected uh, and likely to die. Because we care for a population of New Yorkers that is disproportionately represented in these statistics, we are here to demonstrate our support for the proposed bill to require DOHMH to report to the City Council on cases of maternal mortality and the proposal to codify the Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee created last year. The City and State of New York are taking steps to investigate cases of maternal mortality and design interventions that can improve health outcomes and re reduce health disparities, and we support these efforts. It is important that the committee is comprised of various types of maternal health experts. Doctors, nurses, midwives are essential, but the committee should also represent, as stated previously, uh, social workers, health educators, doulas, patient navigators, and others with a nuanced understanding of social determinants of health. The committee must ensure transparency in all activities. This is necessary to guarantee proper use of funds and the efficiency of the review process. We would like to advocate for the greater availability of disaggregated data. The fragmentation of our EMR systems across the city make it difficult to track patients seen at different institutions and ensure continuity of care. The committee should consider sharing patient level data with providers to help facilitate ongoing linkage to care in a way that protects patient confidentiality. Finally, the review committee should ensure proper dissemination of key findings to all relevant stakeholders and publish results for the general public. The review committee should also coordinate with members of the state appointed mobility mortality uh, review committee to better understand developments and trends in maternal health at the population level. In conclusion, we applaud the city's efforts in dedicating vital resources to investigate the devastating rates of maternal mortality. We are committed to any efforts to collaborate with the city and administration to further these goals. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lindsay Dubois, and I'm Associate Director for Women's Health at Community Healthcare Network. I also work as a doula, as a private practice doula, and a community-based, um, and also for community-based doula programs. Over the last few years, I've supported over 75 families through their birth experience, and I can tell you that doulas make an incredible difference. 
We're here to show our support for this bill and the city's efforts to expand access to doula care. A doula's role providing physical, emotional, and informational support throughout pregnancy and birth is essential to improving birth outcomes for all New Yorkers. People who receive continuous support in birth are more likely to have spontaneous vaginal births and less likely to have pain medication, epidurals, mm -hmm. negative feelings about childbirth, vacuums or forceps assisted deliveries, and cesareans. Despite these benefits, doulas only attend 5% of births in New York City, so we have an important opportunity to expand access and create lasting population impact. The plan developed by the Department of Health must respond to the alarming health disparities, as we've heard today, that we see in New York City. Black women in New York City are 12 times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. So with greater resources, community-based doula programs can help mitigate this devastating health crisis. At the same time, public health researchers are deepening their understanding of the driving factors associated with maternal mortality and other health disparities. The weathering theory suggests that toxic racism sustained over a lifetime can cause premature deterioration of the body, which can have a negative impact on birth. Doulas have an important to role to play in understanding this process and the differential treatment experienced by certain groups. Expanded access to doula support will require training and certification for a large cohort of new doulas. It's essential that training include cultural competency and greater understanding of implicit bias. The plan must also dedicate adequate resources to ensure program sustainability and guarantee that doulas are compensated with a living wage. In my work as a doula, I've had the opportunity to support many women who have endured conditions of toxic stress. My clients have included people who are undocumented and people who do not speak English. I've supported women living in domestic violence shelters without any social support at the time they gave birth. In the face of these challenges, my experience has shown me that doulas help reduce fear, build confidence, improve communication, and simply humanize birth. As one client stated, having the help of a doula can be a blessing. It was for me. My doula listened to me and my body. She handled me with great care and concern. For me, labor wasn't like the horror stories I've heard. My doula made sure I was relaxed, safe, and comfortable. She wasn't just another trained professional in the room. She felt like family. This is why we need our doulas. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to acknowledge we've been joined by stalwart advocate for health equity, Council Member Andy Cohen. And we're going to add one more person to this panel. If I could ask Kathleen McFadden, you can maybe just grab a chair on the side, and we will hear from you as well. Thank you for testifying, and please continue. Hi, my name is Kylan Grin. I'm actually uh, here on behalf of a young person. I work at pol in policy at Girls for Gender Equity. Um, and I'm testifying on behalf of Megan, who can't be here today. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Jean-Louis, and I am a junior at Macaulay Honors College at Brooklyn College, studying, bi studying biomedical ethics and cross-cultural psychology. I would also like to thank the Committee on Health and Committee on Women for having this hearing on access to doula services and maternal mortality. I am a member of Girls for Gender Equity's Young Women's Advisory Council. GGE is an intergenerational organization committed to the physical, psychological, social, and economic development of girls and women. Through education, organizing, and physical fitness, GGE encourages communities to remove barriers and create opportunities for girls and women to live self-determined lives. Doulas, doulas are committed to lowering the infant mortality and maternal mor morbidity rate. Their collective action and offering resources to families so that they can make informed decisions about their care. Their purpose is to ensure a safe and empowering birthing experience. A recent Cochrane review found that continuous support during labor may improve outcomes for women and infants, including shorter duration of labor, decreased use of anesthesia, and decreased, and decreased negative feelings about childbirth experiences. Doulas can become vital in the birthing process for pregnant people within New York City. If we put resources behind assessing and demand of these workers, we can reduce the maternal mortality rate. Signing intro 0913, access to doula services, would be the first step in achieving this goal. Additionally, as a young person, I respectfully ask that intro 0914 include reporting on the number of maternal mortalities disaggregated by race and eth or ethnicity, borough of residence, and age. 
and intro 0913, it is also imperative that the access to doulas include people across the age spectrum. In particular, I want to amplify the importance of young parents' timely and meaningful access to doulas at the as the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene expands this program. And to point to the expertise of Agent Song Doula Services as the program is expanded. Together we can work to reduce maternal mortality rate by ensuring that we have data um, that provides the full context to the issue. New York City's maternal mortality, mortality rate is slightly above average for the US, with 30 of the, the 700 to 900 deaths related to pregnancy and childbirth na nationwide each year. New York City accounts for around 30. Intro 0913 would project, protect um, the maternal mortality, sorry. Um, the collaboration of New York City and New York State in the pursuit of reducing maternal mortality will establish a precedent for other large states to follow. The maternal mortality rate in the United States is simply unacceptable. In the United States, black women die of pregnancy-related causes four times as often as white women. I hope that with the data found in this report, in the reporting that we can continue to reduce the structural in inequalities seen in New York City, whether it be access to healthy food, clean drink drinking waters, water, good schools, and safe neighborhoods. I ask that you support intro 0913 and 0914. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Truly appreciate it. I'll let Megan know. <laughs> Hello, uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Rosenthal, Chairperson Levine, and other committee members. My name is Brittany Brathwaite, and I am an organizing and innovation manager at Girls for Gender Equity. Thank you for calling attention to the pertinent issue of maternal mortality and inequitable reproductive health outcomes, especially among communities of color. GGE envisions a city where people of all ages and genders and their partners, if applicable, are empowered during pregnancy, labor, postpartum, to make healthy decisions for themselves, their children, their families, and their communities. With regard to intro 0913, which we support, studies have shown that access to doula care improves maternal health outcomes by providing people-centered care and reducing the likelihood of surgical interventions such as cesarean deliveries. We m recommend that the city council require the DHMH to include community-based and culturally relevant organizations such as Ancient Song Doula Services as an organization that has been actively spearheading the fight against disparities in maternal mortality and morbidity, particularly for black women over the last decade. Uh, black women and trans and gender nonconforming people face discrimination in medical systems at different intersections of their identities. For example, black women in the U.S. are vulnerable to anti-black racism and gender oppression. Uh, in April 2018, the New York Times expose showed that even when we control for factors that may lead to lower quality health care, such as income or health insurance, black women still have disproportionately negative outcomes when it comes to childbirth um, and postpartum care. Uh, we recommend... Um, to that end, we must ensure that health providers receive training on implicit bias, class and gender bias, anti-racism, and human rights in the practice of health care. We also recommend that you support full-spectrum doula work, which supports people during all phases of pregnancy, including abortion, miscarriage, birth, and adoption, as well as the discussion on issues like race, class, immigration, gender, age, and sexuality impact the, and affect doula care. As you know, GGE's work focuses on young people, and to that end, we... And to that end, all people should receive safe, respectful, affordable, quality health care where they live throughout the course of their lives, especially young people. Access to full-spectrum doula care should be accessible to pregnant and parenting students. As GGE has previously articulated in the School Girls Deserve Report, pregnant and parenting young people experience particular obstacles in their in and their impact to complete their education. In addition to young people receiving access to full spectrum doula care, we recommend that each DOE school assign the role of a pregnant and parenting student liaison to school staff who embodies and upholds social justice, social work practice, and human rights approach in advocating for the needs of pregnant and parenting students at school. Uh, we applaud and support the advancement of intro 0914. We're particularly glad to see the bill requires disaggregated data by race, gender, geography, and other demographic factors that can help b paint a better picture for the needs of New York City. Any data collection should include both quantitative and qualitative methods, including community-based participatory data, in order to understand the impact of race, gender, and socioeconomic inequality on black TGNC young people. 
Uh, finally, the city should cross-reference the National Violent Death Reporting System, the NVDRS data maintained by the CDC with all maternal and mortality morbidity data. The NVDRS, which contains information on violent deaths, is an important tool for black women in particular because violence is a significant health risk for many black women. In some states, homicide is one of the leading causes of death among pregnant women. Um, as one of the 32 states participating in this, uh, in this data model, we have access to data that will help us identify maternal deaths that may be missed in other identification methods. Uh, we applaud the city on the bill's advance today, and we urge the city to take uh, also responsibility for directing, directly confronting racial inequities in maternal health. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your work to advance the bills being heard today. Hi, my name is Catherine McFadden. Um, so I just, I wanted to offer like a public comment uh, and I don't want to detract from everyone who came so well prepared. Um, You're not detracting at all. We're I, very happy to have you. I graduated last year with my master's in midwifery from SUNY Downstate and I've also been a NICU nurse at SUNY Downstate for the past five years. I've been attending um, things on maternal mortality frequently in the past several years. So I have a personal and professional uh, passion of mine. Um, but something I continually see is that government, like the, go it's government officials predominantly who are like, like the DOH has programs and a lot of government funded programs to com to combat the um, discrepancies we see. But that at the government funded hospitals, there's no similar programming or initiative um, to address those issues. There's chronic understaffing. Um, there's acute understaffing by that. I mean, we don't have specialists at the hospital that should be working in the hospital and we don't have specialists for the NICU that should be there and that we don't, we often don't have enough nurses to provide sufficient care to the patients that we care for. And so it's just, I'd love to see an integrated approach, uh, the OBGYNs and like the people who are who are responsible for the patient care environment where a lot of these bad outcomes are happening, get their, our government employees, and I wish there was a integrated approach. And I also hope going forward um, that hospitals will not be able to guard their confidentiality on negative outcomes. I think that's something that the public has a right to know, and especially government-funded hospitals, because even if we only looked at places like Kings County and SUNY Downstate, we would find a lot of the causes for health, health outcome discrepancies. And uh, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate your jumping in on that. It definitely makes sense. Just so everyone knows, the um, Department of Health, thank you, Brenda, has these reports that they've put out. You can find them online. I have a copy, I have an extra copy here, but everyone can see the data that they're currently collecting and um, uh, see what their findings are. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who participated in this hearing today. It was an incredibly, incredibly powerful, powerful discussion that is going to force this city to deal with the unacceptable racial inequalities and maternal mortality and uh, a problem that needs to be addressed systematically from top to bottom in our health system. Um, what you said today, all of you, is going to be entered into the public record. This was streamed online, live, and it's going to be available for uh, download by tomorrow with transcripts available in the coming days. So uh, this is going to be an important record on this critical issue. Thank you very much. This concludes our hearing.